Thank you. Good morning and welcome to today's event uh, sponsored by the Learning Policy Institute and EdSource. I'm Patrick Shields, the Executive Director of the Learning Policy Institute. So our goal today is to take a step back and reflect on California's recent journey from what was really a struggling state, one that on the national stage was labeled from having gone from first to worst to now one of the nation's leaders in terms of our focus on high quality education and equitable education for all students in the state. We really have come a long way in the last 10 years. In a couple of minutes, Laura Hernandez from the Learning Policy Institute is going to describe the seismic shifts in California education in terms of funding and accountability, standards, and who gets to make decisions about our schools. Laura is going to start the conversation about these changes and their impacts on policy, on practice, on opportunities for learning for students in the state, and ultimately on student outcomes. We want to use the day to take stock of how far we have come, and at this time with new leadership in the state, to think about where we still need to go. The title of the report that we're publishing today is The California Way, the Golden State's Quest to Build an Equitable and Excellent Education System. We use the term quest purposefully because we have made great, great progress, but we're still on that journey. As we'll hear from Laura and the other panelists, there's much work to be done. The recent strikes across the state, including the one that started today in Oakland, underscore that we still have challenges. We have too few adults in our schools. Our class sizes are too high. Teacher turnover is unacceptable. There simply aren't enough resources yet in the schools. But as we think about these challenges and how we're gonna take them on in the next four years, we also have to remember that the successes that we've made over the last decade have been a function of the hard work of advocates, community groups, practitioners, and policymakers throughout the state. And as we take on the challenges, these same groups, these same advocates, these same community groups who are represented here today in the room are gonna be there fighting every step of the way. So we're thankful to our funders. The SD Bechtel Jr. Foundation funded this report. The Stewart Foundation funds a series of work in this area. And we at the Learning Policy Institute get core operating support from the Sandler Foundation, the Hewlett Foundation, and the Ford Foundation. Before we get started, I just want to ask people to make sure that they have their cell phones off or on silent to let you know that the restrooms are right through this door here. And if there is an emergency, which we have had before, um, there are exit doors here, here, and through the lobby through which you came. So right now, I'll turn it over to Lewis Friedberg, who's the executive director of EdSource. Lewis. Good morning to all of you. It's a pleasure to see you here today at this point of transition and uh, hope not only in California on a range of issues, but in California education specifically. This conversation comes at a time when, as all of you know, we have a new governor, a new state superintendent of public instruction, from whom we will hear shortly, and a new likely head of the State Board of Education, whom we will also hear from, but wearing another hat today. It also comes at a time of deep concern and turmoil in districts, as Patrick just referred to in uh, Ed Source's home base of Oakland. We have a strike that unfortunately just began today. But today, we'll be looking at what has been accomplished over the past eight years and what has yet to be done. And what I think we would all agree, what happens in California matters. In Congress, and at least in the House of Representatives, education policy is now in the hands of Democrats for the first time in eight years. A couple of weeks ago, I met with uh, Rep Representative Bobby Scott from Virginia, who's chair of the House Education and Labor Committee, and he's trying to put a, a break on some of the policies implemented uh, by the Trump administration over the last several years. But arguably, what we do here in California, what I like to call the country of California, has a much more direct impact on kids. 
And what we do here shapes the lives of millions of kids, one in eight public school children in the United States, and that's in addition to millions more young people in early education and higher education programs. Over the past eight years, EdSource has tracked all these permutations, um, the ins and outs of the multidimensional reforms that have been put in place by Governor Brown, by the State Board, by the good folks over at CDE, State Superintendent, and of course by the administrators, teachers, and staff at hundreds of districts and thousands of schools in California. I think it's fair to say that this has not been a comparable period in California's history where so many education reforms have been put in place under a single governor. I think some people saw the local control funding formula as something entirely new, but actually it's two principal features, the local control aspect of it and the funding formula weren't altogether new. I'm sure many of you in the room uh, recall the term subsidiarity. Uh, that was an ancient theological term that Governor Brown somehow was able to integrate and make a central part of the reform process. Basic idea being that central authority, whether it's the Vatican or Sacramento, should stay out of local matters unless it could do, handle those local matters better. And as for the funding formula, weighted student formula, which was how Governor Brown articulated it in, the, in his State of the State speech in 2012, well that was a term that was in Title I, 1965, and uh, in many other federal uh, grants, and uh, many states had that concept. But somehow all this came together in a, in a remarkably coherent policy framework, and also a philosophical framework. Uh, I was fortunate, actually, on the last day that Jerry Brown was in office, uh, well, it was a Friday, it was the last interview that he did in the governor's office, and my colleague and I, John Fenstewald, talked with him about what he viewed as his accomplishments, which he didn't really want to focus on. He said local control funding formula was just the mechanics of it. Really, the philosophical key, and he talked about Martin Buber, the German philosopher, the key is in the meeting, the meeting between the student and the teacher. And that is what he saw as his legacy, is really trying to get local control and his focus on the creativity that goes on in the classroom. So all these works represent a work in progress. But I think we all have a sense that California is headed in the right direction. We have an opportunity to lead the nation on the education front, especially in light of the incredibly diverse and rich student population that we have. This is a great moment to look at what has been accomplished and where we need to go. And uh, on that note, I'm going to ask Laura Hernandez, who is one of the co-authors, the three co-authors of this most excellent report that, it's, uh, that LPI put out, just came out this morning. So let me hand it over to Laura Hernandez. Good, good morning, everyone. I am honored to be here on behalf of LPI and my amazing co-authors to share findings from this newly published report that explores many of the key points that Patrick and Lewis just spoke on around California's progress, <clears throat> excuse me, in advancing equity and excellence. And as Patrick shared, we, we felt it was a, a timely and important moment for us to take stock of California's progress given the many economic and educational shifts we've seen in just 10 short years, some of which are highlighted here. So we've gone from being in the midst of a deep recession, which was accompanied by significant cuts to education, to feeling the positive effects of resurging economic growth. And with that growth, we've implemented more equitable funding, increasing funds to all districts while providing additional monies to districts with large populations of high need learners. We've also witnessed significant changes in our standards, credentialing and accountability approaches, ultimately moving from a more punitive approach to a more supportive systems that elevate the importance of multiple measures of success. And in this context, like Lewis just mentioned, we've seen a move away from top-down decision-making to a groundbreaking approach that seeks to empower local knowledge and expertise. There we go. 
So all of these shifts have coalesced to create what we call a sea change in California through the relentless efforts of a cross-section of organizations and individuals seeking to advance equity and excellence in our schools, many of whom are here today, we now see multiple policies assembling to construct an unprecedented approach to comprehensive and systemic reform. And given this unique moment that California finds itself in, our research really aimed to take stock of what progress has been made. So on one level, our research asked, how did we get here? What efforts led to the enactment of these policies and how did these efforts influence what we see today? But in addition, we wanted to understand how practice and culture has changed. What impact has this combination of policies had on budgeting, instruction, climate, engagement, and student outcomes? And importantly, what work remains to be done? What does California still need to do to advance equity and excellence for all students? To answer these questions, we first conducted an exhaustive, and I mean exhaustive, <laughs> literature review where we identified themes and promising practices from our review of studies, policy briefs, and news articles on LCFF and other concurrent reforms. And in this way, we built from the work done by researchers, including those from PACE, the LCFF Research Collaborative, and the Getting Down to Facts 2 report series, so we wanted to acknowledge and appreciate their contributions to our collective learning. But we also supplemented our review with 34 targeted interviews with key decision makers and advocates to elaborate on these themes and practices that emerged. And in the full report, you'll see that we detail the decades-long efforts of individuals and groups who paved the way for this unique moment and have allowed for so many to remain committed to the fulfillment of its vision. But for the remainder of this presentation, I'll focus on the changes we're seeing in practice and areas for growth that our research surfaced. So with the local control funding formula, we have seen more equitable funding among California districts, which has offset the decreases felt acutely after the recession and explicitly recognized the increased cost it takes to serve high need students. And with this recognition, reports point to changes in district culture, particularly how equity is now a prominent and central feature of budgeting conversations. And with these shifting mindsets, some districts are allocating resources with equity in mind and exploring innovative ways to ensure monies are reaching sites and students who need it most. And to illustrate, in the Los Angeles Unified School District, who has partnered with a coalition of community groups, they've developed a student equity need index, an innovative tool that allows the district to equitably calculate and distribute LCFF funds to sites with concentrated need. And two of our panelists today will be able to speak to that initiative. But despite these positive trends, there are significant roadblocks to resource equity. Many leaders still feel the financial squeeze generated by earlier disinvestment, a burden that will continue to grow in the face of the state's silent recession, the rising costs that we see in districts with relation to teacher pensions, facilities, and to the teacher shortage. And these claims point to questions about the overall adequacy of K-12 funding to meet student needs, an argument underscored by the recent strike in Los Angeles and the one beginning in Oakland today. Other critiques call for state funding to be, to be accompanied, excuse me, by more transparency around the use of supplemental and concentration funds to ensure that monies are reaching students who need it most, and also point to the ongoing challenge of overcoming the compliance orientation or mentality that decades of categorical funding have ingrained in many district cultures. In the arena of teaching and learning, we see districts reinvesting in capacity building, an important step in rebuilding the state's professional learning infrastructure, which was largely decimated after the recession. Districts, for example, have used funds to support the rollout of Common Core and to provide targeted professional development around LCFF target groups. But districts have also allocated funds to allow for more teacher collaboration and job embedded supports, including access to coaches or teacher leaders. A case in point is the Chula Vista Elementary School District, who have leveraged their funds to codify a promising system of collaborative learning for its educators. And we will hear more from Dr. Francisco Escobedo on our first panel today, who may be able to speak more to that. Another key trend that we found in professional learning are the growth of learning networks. So networks that allow districts and regions to systematically share knowledge across areas to be able to spur continuous improvement. So some examples are Math in Common, the California Collaborative for Educational Excellence's Professional Learning Networks, 
But the instructional leadership core as well, which our panelist Danielle Letts will be able to speak to, is another promising form for this sort of learning exchange. And with these professional shifts, we do see some changes in instruction. We have a growing body of research that tells us that California classrooms are increasingly characterized by student-centered learning instead of the, lo the less robust practices we saw proliferate under NCLB. And with growing attention to college and career readiness, we also see districts allocating resources to more rigorous course sequences like A to G aligned classes and real world learning programs that foster 21st century skills. But like with resource equity, many barriers remain to improving teaching and learning. Although we have bright spots, we see gaps in quality and access to rich professional development, suggesting there's still a long road ahead to rebuilding the state's professional learning infrastructure. Questions also remain about supports for LCFF target groups. While research points to increased attention to English learners, foster youth, and low-income students, some suggest that districts are still falling short and others, too, point to the needs of other subgroups not named under LCFF, like students with special needs or African-American students, and question what resources can be generated to support them. And finally, the teacher shortage poses a significant challenge. The shortage and its accompanying turnover has resulted in the hiring of tens of thousands of teachers with substandard credentials, which has implications for student learning, but it also stifles the capacity building continuous improvement at the center of LCFF, that require teachers to stay and engage in ongoing professional learning for sustained periods of time. In addition to teaching and learning, we, the spotlight that California has put on school climate, uh, with that, we see evidence that districts are using their funds to try to make improvements in this area. So we see districts using funds to increase support for students' holistic, their holistic needs, including hiring more staff like psychologists or social workers when compared to staffing rates before LCFF. Districts are also invent, investing in evidence-based practices like social-emotional learning, PBIS, and restorative justice. And here our report highlights the work of San Diego Unified and their efforts to become a restorative justice district which they have done by piloting restorative justice, conducting professional development to ultimately build an infrastructure to support whole district rollout. But we also draw attention to the required use of climate surveys, so tools that are garnering broader perspectives and can shed light on climate efforts in schools. And here we note the promising work by the core districts, which have been featured in several PACE reports around social emotional learning and how surveys can be interpreted and used to inform action. So while we've seen strides in school improvement, California still lags behind other states in class size and the provision of services. We also continue to see students in the state's highest poverty districts with significantly less access to personnel who provide social and emotional supports. The use of climate data remains an area of growth. Many hold questions about survey rigor and their consistent implementation. But they also point to the need for supports for districts and schools to help them interpret data to make in strategic improvements. And along those lines, research points to the overall need for ongoing professional development around school climate. While educators and leaders who've earned their credentials under the state's revised educator standards report more exposure to topics related to school climate, they still clamor for more development around nurturing positive school environments. With California's imperative for local decision-making and community engagement, we are seeing that district leaders have broad support for these engagement requirements, as suggested by one recent study where 75% of surveyed district leaders agreed that community involvement helped ensure that district goals aligned with local needs. And with this enthusiasm for engagement, research is showing that districts are creating more opportunities and forms for stakeholders to lend their input. Another dynamic that we see emerging is that community groups are also taking this opportunity to partner with districts to augment their capacity. So groups such as Families in Schools and Californians for Justice who work with historically marginalized students and families have played a pivotal role in district outreach by facilitating some of this engagement and modeling culturally responsive and meaningful strategies. is a trend while we are seeing promising trends challenges still persist the length and complexity of district LCAPs is often and primarily cited as the barrier to fuller engagement but also district capacity itself remains limited making it difficult for them to actualize the state's vision 
in many instances, limited district capacity, have made it difficult to include diverse voices and even led some districts to default to more transactional forms of engagement, those emphasizing information dissemination instead of true dialogue among partners. Some studies also point to trust as a critical factor in district community engagement, suggesting that more intentional relationship building may be necessary for the state's vision to be met. And finally, what have all these changes in funding, accountability, and engagement, how are California students doing? What outcomes is the state producing in this new context? So across a range of outcomes, we see California students making progress, but ample work still needs to be done to improve excellence and equity in our schools. So we see evidence of this in California NAEP scores. Whereas California once ranked in the bottom five on math and reading, the state now ranks between 25th and 35th and its average scores near national averages. And while that reflects improvement in absolute and relative terms, there is still ample room for growth and gaps in performance between students of, colors, or students of color and white counterparts persist. Uh, also notable is that analyses of state test scores identify similar trends in achievement and achievement gaps. We see similar trends in graduation rates, so rates have steadily risen since 2010, despite the slight dip we see as a result of the new calculation formulas instituted in 2017. But at the same time, gaps between racial groups, which we see here depicted, have persisted while we see these overall improvements. And this is an important point that's elevated by one of our panelists, Dr. Rucker Johnson, in his Getting Down to Facts 2 report, which he can speak more to on this panel today. And these trends hold true for suspension and expulsion. We see a steady and in some cases significant improvement in this arena, which has resulted in, in increased learning hours for students, particularly African American youth. At the same time, punitive discipline practices continue to disproportionately affect students of color, suggesting that more work is necessary to ensure schools and are inclusive and responsive to all. So what does this mean all for the road ahead? Through our findings, we suggest that California stay the course on its multifaceted and equity-oriented vision, but must address key roadblocks to deepen impact. Primary among these is funding. We suggest that the state should continue supporting LCFF fundamentals and other investments, including those for early childhood. Yet California should refine its policies to increase the adequacy of its formula and should improve the transparency of budgeting practices to ensure that equity is truly being achieved. Issues related to capacity are also clear areas for growth. The state should build upon its existing assets and bright spots to create a more comprehensive professional learning structure. And the continued development and investment in networks for professional learning can be a critical part of that path forward. And finally, the ongoing teacher shortage continues to undermine many of the promising efforts that the state and its districts are embarking on making policies to build a stable, diverse, and well-prepared workforce a critical priority. So in closing, we do see significant progress in California, along with significant need. And so the, for, for the remainder of our event today, we hope to engage you and our speakers in rich discussions about the road ahead and our ongoing quest to advance equity and excellence. Thank you for your time, and without further ado, I will turn it over to Dr. Linda Darling-Hammond to introduce our next speaker. Thank you, Laura, for sharing the details of the report. Um, I want to recognize the lead author, Roberta Ferger, who is going to be uh, moderating a later panel. Um, how we landed where we are today in education is a big undertaking, and it's a story that needs to be told. Uh, many folks know Roberta in a variety of ways, but she started out as a journalist. And so the telling of the story uh, is uh, well uh, in, well instantiated in the uh, long journey that we got here with many, many, many wonderful narratives along the way. Uh, and we appreciate uh, having that broad vision. Uh, it's especially true now with the new leadership we have with education in the state. Um, and this brings me to our keynote speaker, who better to help us begin to look ahead uh, than our new state superintendent, Tony Thurman. Tony has a long track record of advocating for schools and children through public service uh, from his 20-year career as a social worker, 
uh, to his time as an assembly member in the California legislature, where he took action on a wide variety of supports for children, to his most recent election as 28th California State Superintendent of Public Instruction. Tony is an advocate uh, for all children, and especially those placed furthest from opportunity. He has a rich agenda to support uh, those commitments. He's also um, a wonderful friend and a uh, father and family man. I was speaking to him earlier this morning uh, as he was getting his kids off to school in Richmond where they were heading off on a trip uh, during their break to feed immigrant children on both sides of the Southern California border. And that's the kind of heart Tony has and that he has developed in his own children and that he will develop in the work that we do on behalf of children in this state. Tony. Good morning. I know we can do better than that. Good morning. Good morning. Oh, well, hey, hey. <laughs> Linda, thank you. I, you know, I was, uh, when the governor gave his State of the State address, uh, was that last week? You know, time is flying by. You know, it's a month and a half on the job, and uh, nothing broken yet, hopefully. Um, when the gov I had the best seat in the house, sitting on the assembly floor, as the governor talked about his choice to be the new uh, uh, chair of the State Board of Education, uh, and Linda Darling-Hammond. Thank you, Linda, and I'm excited to work with you. Um, uh, you know, I'm appreciative to have come to the legislature at a time when we had the local control funding formula, and I know that, you know, Dr. Kirst has been a part of that framework and dreaming that up, and, you know, as someone who, who was on a school board in 2008, when the economy was probably the worst we've seen, um, my first night on, as a, being sworn in on the school board, uh, before I even put my hand down, they said, we want you to vote to close 10 schools. I almost passed out. I cussed a lot of bad words, too, right before that happened. And uh, I just thought, this can't be a good thing. And they said, well, we know it's bad for kids, but we're going to ask you to do it anyway because the state's making us do it. And, you know, I took issue with that. I thought, if it's bad for kids, we have no business doing it. We have to have the political will to find ways to help our young people. And thankfully, hey, well, all right then. Because I'd been on a city council um, that was one of five cities in our unified school district, I knew that we could reach out to our council members in those five cities and say, these are our kids. And they came to our rescue with money to help pay for the cost that our district was struggling with. But that is not the case anymore and districts continue to struggle, and LCFF has meant a great deal uh, to school districts who say, um, we cannot do the work that you pass down without the funding to do it. And so I love the framework of LCFF, I love the framework of local control, I love the framework of LCAP saying we want to engage partners and stakeholders, parents, students, teachers, educators, administrators, all coming together to create a document that says we can, as a community, prioritize the students who should get the additional help that they need. That, to me, that is equity. Uh, I love that we have, um, you know, last year legislation that says that LCFF should be, uh, you know, amended to have more money to support uh, the districts that serve the lowest performing students and was, was honored to support that legislation. But we have so much more to do. Um, we are where we are, and um, you know, I'm hopeful that this new beginning, a new governor, a new legislature, um, means a time for us to come together as partners and say that California will lead the way, and that the best way that we can lead is to move away from being 45th in the nation or 41st. You know, people debate, is it 41, is it 46, is it 45th? Whatever it is, it's not good enough. The kids of California deserve to be number one. They say you show your budget, but you show your values by what you put in your budget. So let's put kids who we think are number one, let's make our budget look like that and treat them like they're number one and move from being 45th in the nation in per pupil spending. Um, I want to just offer thanks to all of you who are reaching for excellence and reaching for, for equity. The six-year-old me thanks you for what you do. 
because the six-year-old me uh, was a kid who was uh, the son of immigrants from Panama. My mother was a teacher uh, who taught in San Jose. My father was an immigrant who came all the way from Detroit, Michigan, by way of Mississippi. It's okay to laugh. It's really, it doesn't hurt. <laughs> um, my father served in Vietnam, and I did not see my father until I became an adult. I found my father on the internet. So my mom raised four kids by herself until she could not. She was very sick, and when I was six years old, she lost her battle to cancer, and my sibling group and I got split up. Two stayed in San Jose, two, the youngest two, myself and my five-year-old brother, got sent to live in Philadelphia with a cousin that we never met until we showed up on her doorstep. And she raised us, even though she worked two jobs and went to night school to get her own education. She raised us on the free lunch program, on food stamps, I'm talking about food stamp coupons, not the EBT card, uh, and a lot of government cheese. And I, I know a lot of you are looking at me like, what is government cheese? It comes in a big old box with thick plastic wrapped inside, and if you can get through it, it's the best grilled cheese sandwich you might ever have. It's a public program that really helped me, and I always joked that we ate so much government cheese that I thought that USDA was a brand name. The point is this, the greatest public program that I ever had a chance to participate in was getting a public education. It literally saved my life. When I think about the kind of gaps and cracks that I could have fallen into, uh, I'm thankful that I had educators who believed in me, who said that your life will be different than it started, that in spite of coming from humble beginnings, it was an education that opened doors for me to become a social worker, spent 20 years working with young people working in our schools, to get elected to many offices, and I think about it every single day, how easy it would have been for me to end up in California State Prison. And instead, I ended up as the state superintendent of the great state of California. We need to give that to all six million of our kids. That's what reaching for equity is about. That is what this time is about. It is time for us to say that now we're gonna put our words into practice. We've said for decades that we can close the school to prison pipeline if we give every young person quality education before they start kindergarten. But yet we still have an achievement gap and an opportunity gap that persists for African-American students, for Latinos and English learners, from kids who come from low-income backgrounds. It is time for us to put our money where our mouth is and to say that we will provide quality early education for all of our students in our state. And I'm honored to be in this office and assuming this office at a time that we have a governor who not only, we have a governor, get this all, we have a governor who campaigned on early education and universal preschool. You know, when's the last time you heard those types of things? And then in his remarks, the governor in his budget proposal, essentially, if you listen to what he said, 51% of what he talked about in his proposed budget was early education through K-12 and higher ed. If you look at what the social services contribution was, that's 71% of the budget. When's the last time you heard a governor say, we are going to take juvenile corrections out of corrections and put it into a social service context? That sounds like a framework for closing the school to prison pipeline. That sounds like our momentum is now. Many of you probably were in the assembly hearing yesterday um, that focused on creating universal preschool. Some of you may even have attended the hearing, the, uh, the workshop that uh, the California Department of Education has created for how we close the achievement gap. In the same week, we are having conversations. My point is, our timing is now. The momentum is now. The report, and I'm thankful for the report. Thank you, Linda, and your team for giving me an advanced copy of, all I saw on the top of it was embargoed, embargoed. Um, uh, can I? Do I have to recall the tweets that I put out about the report? <laughs> you know, I appreciate the report for helping us to see the accomplishments that have been made as a result of this framework uh, around LCFF, around LCAP. Um, I'm appreciative that the governor and his budget proposal has given more money to address the cost, to, to really enhance LCFF, to reflect some of the rising costs of education and to address the conversation around the cost of pension. One of the, one of the many um, work groups that we have, are launching is a work group that focuses on how do we identify permanent funding sources of revenue uh, for schools, uh, for education. Um, 
Why do I, why do I lift that up? Because you all know as well as I do that when we have another economic downturn, if we don't have new permanent sources of revenue, everything that has been created through LCFF uh, and through some of the things being proposed in the governor's budget, they will be eviscerated. And we'll be having a conversation about cutting programs that we know are uh, important for kids. We will be hearing school board members and superintendents and leaders in education saying things like this, we know it's bad for kids, but we're asking you to do it anyway. Well, if it's bad for kids, let's not do it. Let's find a better way to serve kids and let's find a way to get past our structural financial deficit that impacts what we do educationally and programmatically. Some of you know that in 2020, there's likely to be a ballot measure that takes a look at what happens with Proposition 13. And that means that there could be a kind of split roll tax that could develop another $11 billion for the state general fund, maybe four to five, maybe even $6 billion for K-12 education. Uh, I think these are the things that we need to be talking about. Now, please, someone sitting in this room right now texting their friends saying, Tony Thurman just said he wants us to get our taxes raised. That is not what we're talking about. Um, this measure, as I understand it, as it is envisioned, would shield seniors, homeowners, and small business people from paying more taxes. But for large commercial property owners, they'd be asked to pay their fair share. They'd be asked to see the loophole close that they have benefited from since Prop 13 passed in the 70s. I don't know about you, but I think our schools could use that money and more. And so if you care about developing, yeah, you should clap for that. You know, she, she's the only person who's saying, oh, he's not going to tax me. Look, if you're a millionaire or you own a lot of commercial property, well, then you should be concerned. But anyone else, every other Californian who's in working class or middle class, who's worked hard to support our economy, who's tightened their belt to say that we are a family and that we work together to support our state and our economy, we're asking those folks to do the same thing. Uh, but we can't do it alone. If you read the Getting Down to Facts 2 report, you know that the number that we need to um, properly fund education in the state is in the billions, like hundreds. So we have to be looking at every type of permanent revenue source that we can so that we can ensure all of our kids get a quality education from birth through higher education. Because I would love it if we could change the narrative and stop having people fight over, well, is the money going into K-12 or is it going into higher education? As far as I'm concerned, that's a false narrative. We should be talking about money from early education through K-12 education, through higher education. Because a long time ago, students in this state could get a higher education, a quality higher education for almost nothing. Now we are seeing that more of our students are homeless and hungry and struggling to keep up with the rising cost of getting into higher education. There'll be a million and a half jobs in technology in, in just a few years. At the rate that we are going, we will only have half of the applicants for those jobs unless we make changes to ensure that we have computer science offered through our schools from early education through 12th grade and that our kids have technology that works. You know, uh, I couldn't believe it when some students told me that the way they get access to Wi-Fi is when a truck with a hotspot pulls up because of limits in their community. This is California. We can and we will do better. We will lead. We will reach for equity. We will reach for excellence. All of our students can achieve. I'll never forget the time that the billionaire person told me, they said, Tony, you should only focus on the kids who show promise and potential. And I told them to their face, I reject that notion. All of our kids show promise and potential. It's on us to help them develop that potential. So let us be the ones who together reach for excellence, reach for equity, and help every one of our students achieve. Is that okay with you? Is that all right with you? I need to know. Raise your right hand. If that's okay with you, let me hear you say yeah. yeah. That was, uh, I believe that you can do better. I believe that we will set the bar high for our students. It broke my heart to hear a critical leader in education a few weeks ago say that as it relates to uh, how we serve students of color getting into a university and being retained in a university, this person actually said, 
well, maybe we should set goals that, that are achievable. And I said, you know what? Our job is to set the bar high, right? The title of today is Reaching for Excellence and Equity. That means we set the bar high and we give students the tools that they need to get to achieve those goals. And so I'm gonna ask you one more time. Are you ready to reach for excellence? Let me hear you say, yeah. yeah. Are you ready to make sure every single student gets the same great opportunities to an education? Let me hear you say, oh yeah. That's it, I'm done. I'm gonna drop the mic because I feel the hook coming. Thank you for your work. I hope you will come and join us at the Department of Education. Uh, I hope you'll reach out to us for the number of work groups that we've put together that address everything from closing the achievement gap to getting new revenue for our schools to STEM and STEAM and career technical education to early education. If you wanna be a part of it, there is a place for you. I look forward to our great work together. Have a great day. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Superintendent Thurman. Let's just give him one round of applause before he leaves. Great to see the passing of the baton and the new energy in Sacramento. Um, and I'm going to ask our panel to pull up their seats, and I'm going to move over here. Um, you know, one of the great things about California, we talk about the gold, we talk about Silicon Valley, uh, but I think, you know, the greatest asset we have are our people. And uh, got five amazing people here who have been working in the trenches at different levels of education. And, uh, you know, thinking about the country of California, it's just really a small number of people who are, who are making all of this, all of this work. Um, and many of you in this room uh, as well. So I'm just going to introduce the panelists very quickly. Um, Mike Kirst, many of you know, Professor Emeritus of Education and Business Administration at Stanford. Uh, I was privileged to audit a class of his about 25 years ago, kind of set me on this path, um, as he has many other people, probably many of you in this room. Uh, and he's just played an instrumental role in the reforms uh, that we've seen in the last eight years, uh, probably much more than we actually know. Mike, Mike is very uh, modest about his, his engagement in these issues. Um, very happy to have uh, Superintendent Francisco Escobedo, who's uh, superintendent in Chula Vista, uh, right on the border, uh, one of the more contested zones in, uh, in the country. Uh, serves more than 29,000 students and um, showing great success in uh, leveraging the resources there to target supports towards highest needs students, many English learners, but not, not all of them. You'll tell us a little bit more about that. Thank you. Thank you for coming up, to Superintendent. I know it's tough to leave your district even for a day. Um, Next to him is uh, Orea Montes Rodriguez. She is Executive Vice President of the Community Coalition. She oversees education reform campaigns there. LA has also been a contested zone recently. Glad to see things have moved along a bit there. Um, and under her leadership, Community Coalition has supported e equity-centered initiatives like the Student Equity Needs Index. We'll hear a little bit more about that. Um, talking about teachers, the heart of this entire enterprise. Uh, we're thrilled to have Danielle Letts, who is a fifth grade teacher and a member of the Instructional Leadership Corps, uh, which uh, I'd like to hear more about, and we will shortly, a teacher-led professional development network that has trained more than 200 teacher leaders. Uh, welcome, Danielle. And um, at the end of the row, uh, David Rattray, Many of you know him as well. Uh, really been really so instrumental in bringing the business community into this discussion. Um, David oversees the Center for Education, Excellence, and Talent Development at the uh, Los Angeles, tell me it's a Chamber of Commerce, right? LA Area Chamber of Commerce, um, as well as Unite LA, the School to Career Partnership of Los Angeles. So, let me talk 
go to Mike Kirst first. Uh, Mike, as we were just saying, you played such a significant role in, in many of these reforms that we've seen in the last eight years. Can you just summarize, and I know this is a tough job for anybody, particularly a professor, uh, what are the major accomplishments that you see of the LCFF um, and the, the reforms that they were, and, and the challenges they were intended to address? Well, the LPI group, uh, I think, outlined a lot of the outcomes that we've had and, and from the process. So I'm going to talk uh, about the design of state reform that has taken place over the last uh, eight to ten years. Uh, it, Design is really important, and our, our approach is what one calls systemic reform. In other words, you look at all parts of the education system, and you need to address virtually all of those parts, and you need to do that in a coherent and aligned way so that the parts all fit together, they're all working with the same synergy in the same directions. LPI displayed that in part through the puzzle pieces, but let me do it uh, briefly through uh, just one of our outcomes, which are in the uh, uh, standards. When, when, you, when you look at it, we've overhauled every one of our major standards now with uh, art pending. We have the new math standards, new English language art standards, next generation science standards, history civic standards. For the first time, we have computer science standards. Uh, we passed health uh, framework and, and standards. And so how do you fit that into this? You, then you have to adopt new materials, new content, uh, new uh, various instructional uh, aids like textbooks. Those have to align to your standards. And we've been able to accomplish that. We have a brand new assessment, of course, a smarter balanced assessment. It's computer adaptive. Students have to go into it and, and uh, defend their answers. It has a performance exam where they have to put things together and come to their own conclusions. And that standard is set at the level of college and career ready. So that's a very high standard. The old a, uh, assessment, CST, somebody picked a number out of the air called 800, and that became Nirvana. And I never could figure out what there was magic about 800. So we went through a standard setting process of what really is college and career ready. Uh, then, as uh, LPI indicated in their presentation, uh, we've uh, done a great deal of change with our capacity build uh, with our teachers, the crucial people in the, and principals uh, that carry on in the school. Nobody mentioned what Linda Darling Hammond did on the uh, California Teacher Commission. That's one of the great untold stories, completely revamping our standards for entering the profession, tightening and, uh, and weeding out some of the weak providers, overhauling the performance exam teachers have to demonstrate at the end uh, of their teacher preparation. I could go on, but that's important, and I'll uh, speak briefly to uh, in-service education. Uh, the, an, another area that we have, of course, dealt with is finance, which has been covered here, I think, pretty well. English learners, we have uh, passed an English learners uh, roadmap which uh, provides, a, uh, I think, a systemic integrated approach to this. Of course, and now we have a new uh, English uh, assess learner assessment uh, to replace the CELT. So we have much more of a comprehensive system there. Career and technical education. Uh, the, uh, we spent over a billion dollars on the Career Pathways Trust, linking high school, community college, and new pathways. Uh, and then uh, more money on re overhauling the regional occupation centers. College readiness, uh, I, I think in a pretty stunning development for me, uh, both Cal State and community colleges have dropped their traditional placement exams. I mean, this is, uh, you know, I didn't, uh, the, the hegemony of the math departments has been broken up, and I didn't expect to live to see that. And so the, uh, now they're working much more closely with K-12, uh, they use a smarter balanced assessment in thinking about placement. So we've made a lot of headway reaching across uh, those levels. So let me stop there and, and mention some things that uh, I think we need to do in the future to illuminate what uh, LPI said. Uh, I think on the capacity building, uh, the scale of it is mind-boggling. 
If you look at our math scores, they're not great. Uh, they're, they're poor. Uh, and I'm calculated off an envelope, back of an envelope, that we have maybe 120,000 teachers who need better math preparation to teach effectively to our standards. That would include most of the elementary teachers and many of them uh, in, in the middle grades as well. We have, you know, we need a moonshot to do this. Uh, the kinds of programs that we've had for capacity building of principals and teachers have been nibbling at the problem, but they're not at the scale that we need. Uh, I think another area that troubles me and that, that we haven't mentioned is special education. I could spend 15 minutes on what, you know, the brief, brief problems of them. Uh, we, of course, have a raging teacher shortage. We have an outdated federal law. We never overhauled the finance system, so it ha it's not really effective and designed well. Uh, and we have a lot of focus on procedures and not a lot of focus on whether kids are learning. Uh, another area emerging is alternative schools. When we identified the lowest schools, uh, for ESSA, a lot of those were alternative schools with graduation rates below 67%. And all of a sudden, there's all, uh, all these school districts calling up, how do I improve my alternative schools? Used to be called, many of them are called continuation schools. Nobody much knows at this point. Uh, so those are just some of the areas. The biggest gap, I would say, a big gap in, in this systemic reform that was never addressed is teacher evaluation. We're operating under the 1971 Stall Act, a 1971 Teacher Evaluation Act. Uh, now, the Obama administration, I think, got in the way of, uh, of this, but in terms of, of being able to overhaul it sensibly, but I think at some point that needs to be on the agenda. So let me stop there and say that there was design and systemic thinking all the way across. Mike, just a quick question. I wanted just to ask your thoughts on the LCAP, the Local Control and Accountability Plan, which is such a central piece of this and really was designed for people to be able to hold districts accountable. How do you think that's worked out? And, and do you think this will be a useful document and won't go the way of the SARC, the School Accountability Report Card, which is... Yeah, I think the, uh, and, and part of the systemic reform was aligning accountability with all I just talked about. Uh, and the, uh, the, the, L, the local control funding formula did a lot of that. It's evolving, it's getting better. We have uh, brand new uh, transparency requirements coming online from some budget language in the 2018 budget. Uh, and I think it, it incrementally gets better. Uh, uh, it's a, we're still a work in progress. Uh, it has shaken things up at the local level. We still need to build, build better connections between the LCAP, which is often over here, and the school budget <coughs> operating on a bunch of old input formulas. You know, if you have 25 pupils, you get a teacher and a 15th of a counselor and all that sort of thing. So uh, part of it is that the, that the LCAP and the budget process need to work more in synergy. Uh, and I think that's a role uh, that, uh, that we need to develop in the future. Okay, terrific. Um, I know we're going to try to get some questions in from you. Do we have a way for cards on your table? So if you have a question, write it down and raise your hand and somebody will come and grab them and we'll see how many we can squeeze in. I'm going to go to Superintendent Escobedo. I should have mentioned you're an elementary school district. Must be one of the largest elementary districts in the state. Um, these reforms that uh, Mike Chris was talking about. Um, I'm wondering to what extent this has been an opportunity to, to, for you to use resources that you might not have had otherwise to advance equity amongst your students. Right. Well, Lewis, you started this session talking about the interaction between the teacher and the student. And our focus on how to utilize these resources is to fortify, right, that work between that teacher and the student. And uh, Mr. Kirst talked about all the standards that were adopted. I mean, it takes time, not only to understand the standards, but then how do you implement these standards in the classroom? So we invested $4.5 million to ensure that there is a master teacher at every single site to really assist the teachers in making meaning out of the standards. And then how are, the, how are these standards then implemented in the classroom? And these master teachers were selected by teachers within the site 
Because trust is really critical. Teachers need to know that they have a teacher that they can ask to come into the classroom, that they can teach, co-teach with the teacher to learn new practices as well. But having a master uh, teacher at every site is not just enough. Move your microphone a little bit away from your face. Pull it down. Okay. Okay. We're just getting a bit. You get down. a little passionate about <laughs> this. <laughs> no, no, it's, it's, okay. It's, but having a master teacher is not enough. Teachers still, need. Still, a little I'm bit still further. having problems. Okay. How's that? Down further. Down further. How's that? Beautiful. We'll try. Okay. Great. But having a master teacher is not enough. Actually, sorry, move it away from your mouth a little bit. Oh, but I'm really Let's having problems. Back. Maybe you can help me. Oray <laughs> will help out. Yeah, I'll try not to move. Yeah, How's that? Pull it down. Yeah. Pull it down. Start okay. Close the mouth. Okay. How's that? Great. Almost there. Okay. We'll we'll we'll, we'll give it a go. Well, you see, having master teachers at every site is not enough. Teachers need time during the instructional day, not after school during the instructional day to meet, to meet to plan, to understand the, to how, how do you plan these standards? How do you then create those important intervention for students who may be English learners, African Americans, uh, and, and not only academically, but emotionally and socially? They're also given the time, you know, being a teacher can be very isolated, all right? Uh, many teachers stay within their classroom and rarely do they have the opportunity to visit other teachers, to visit other classrooms. So it, it is time where the teachers and the administrators are afforded time to visit different classrooms within the school and looking at other schools that may have done better with students of similar demographics. So teachers are freed up not only to collaborate, but also to observe and share ideas, not only within the school, but across the system. You know, t you know that, that time is investment is critical, critical for teachers because these standards um, have tremendous implication in the rigor and the type of creativity we expect our kids to uh, uh, to perform at the school. So we, sp we spent $5.8 million to hire art teachers, music, visual arts, dance teachers to come in and free up the teachers so they can meet during the instructional day. You know? Our LCAP funds about 25 million. I mean, that's a significant percentage. Additionally, you know, I believe uh, Superintendent Thurman talked a little bit about the social ills. In the last five years, we have a 20% increase of homelessness. So we, we invested about $2 million with social workers and counselors to help our foster kids and our homeless students as well, creating structures with the county mental health services to assist our teachers and our schools with the uh, difficulties uh, that our students face. Just have to ask you, is this making a difference in your, are you, are you seeing uh, outcomes? It's making a huge difference. When you look at our target groups versus the state, we pretty much double the input. For example, I believe uh, in the state, uh, with African Americans, about 30% typically are proficient or, or exceeding standards in our district is 64%. When you look at English learners, you see almost double the increases in exceeding and profit. You see it in, in our Filipino population. You see it in our homeless population. You're seeing it in our foster kids, a double digit gains above state average. You know, and, and, and you know, thank you. Yeah, round of applause. <laughs> and, and again, it's, it's, it's tough work, but, but we afford our teachers to be truly professionals. We afford our teachers to be leaders, to, to construct, you know, their professional development as, as they observe 
you know, what's occurring at their side. So, you know, we invest in fortifying that teacher-student interaction. We create that support system to help our students with the, you know, difficulties that they find in their neighborhood, and especially with all the political climate of deportation, it's been very, very difficult. And, and just quickly on the, the, those millions that you invested in all these other programs, was that through supplemental concentration funds, or was that through your overall budget? In other words, what difference did this make to get those additional it, it, funds? It's typically through our L supplemental concentration funds. However, we definitely utilize some federal funds and LCFF funds to, uh, you know, even more so with, with uh, the silent recession, you know, we have to cut into other funds to continue, you know, investing, you know, on our, on our students and teachers. Okay, terrific. Hopefully we can come back to you. And again, if you have any questions, raise your hands and somebody will come and, come and find you. Uh, Ray, I'm going to come back to you, but I'm going to just skip, skip to Danielle Let's um, We'll stay in the schools. Um, you um, have been working with the Instructional Leadership Corps. I'm wondering if you could just tell us a little bit about that and how key is the, do you think, the role of networks are, uh, teachers or otherwise, in uh, bringing some of these initiatives that are happening at a local level or in one school to more schools, more districts? So apparently the Instructional Leadership Corps is the best kept secret in California, because every time I talk about it, like, wait, what is that? So I'm really happy to be able to talk about it today. It's a joint project between the California Teachers Association and SCOPE and the National National Board Resource Center at Stanford. And the idea was... And SCOPE is the... Stanford Center for Opportunity Policy and Education. Okay. Okay, <laughs> yes. I always worry about that one. Then it gives you an A. Right? <laughs> um, and the idea is, you know, teachers teaching teachers and teachers learning from teachers and using that as our basis for professional development. Um, I've been to, I don't know how many professional development sessions in my teaching career. And so many of them were those one day, one shot, then they're gone, they're not in my district, they can't answer those questions, or it's like, well, when I did this in a class with 15 students with no EL, okay, that's not my classroom. Um, so having those opportunities for teachers to share and work with other teachers and learn from one another and use our expertise has been an amazing opportunity for teachers in the state. And I think the last numbers I saw were we've reached over 100,000 teachers in California, which is amazing. And what I'm seeing now is my district in particular, a couple of years ago, we didn't have any professional development days built into our calendar. They were all either summer or after school. That's a limiting opportunity for professional development. At 3.30 in the afternoon after teaching all day, there's only so much you're gonna get out of professional development there. In the middle of summer, there's only so much you're gonna get. So having opportunity to build those into our calendar, and that's part of our, that's part of our calendar now. We actually have three days. And, and in, could you just remind yes. us that your district, what oh, district? thank you. Um, I teach in Alamark Union School District, which is in East San Jose. And that those three professional development days, it's actually in our collective bargaining agreement with our teachers association, where they're jointly planned. So teachers have input in what those professional development days are gonna look like. What are we gonna be doing? And the last couple of years, a majority of those sessions have been run by teachers. Some instructional coaches, some teachers. I've done a few, we've had other teachers come in and it's been a really positive experience. And what I'm seeing from teachers and the feedback I get from teachers, because they can ask me, so when you do this with your kids, what happened? Or I tried this, but this happened. Because we all know lessons don't always go right the first time. So be able to have that feedback or have somebody you can go talk to. I get emails every day. Hey, can you send me that activity you did? Or I tried this, but this happened. What, did I, what do I do? To be able to build those relationships and share with teachers has been amazing. And so just how does yes. it work? So you've got a network of mm -hmm. teachers you meet, or is it uh, virtual, or how does, how does it work? Well, our mid-year conference actually starts tomorrow. 
um, where we'll be meeting in Santa Clara. And we meet twice a year, once in the summer and once in mid-year, and that's where we all get together. Every that's from teachers from? All across California. All over the state, okay. Mm -hmm. um, and that's where we do a lot of like check-in, what's working, learning from one another. If um, some districts might have had, it, or some teams might have had some difficulty getting on their district's professional development calendar, if there was some tension between the two groups sometimes. So just kind of st help strategize how we're able to do that. How are you able to be successful? Or if you're running into other kind of difficulties, there's probably somebody in the state who's had something similar that we can learn from. And then from that, you have a resource of like, oh, you know what, this district, this team in this district is doing this, contact them and pull in resources that way. So it's just been a really great way to share throughout our state. And how many teachers are involved now, approximately? Um, it's just over 200, it varies and fluctuates year to year, but it's about 200 to 250. And some of the teachers are now instructional coaches, some have gone into administration, some teachers have left, some new teachers have come in, um, but it's just over about 200. Okay, so there's obviously room for growth in this, right? I mean, mm -hmm. are there other networks like this or are you kind of, is this a, a new model? It's the only one I know like this one, um, but I'm very proud of it and talk about it and like anything we can do to encourage this idea of teachers teaching teachers and supporting teachers with what's working well in our classrooms and learning from one another. Because I think the role of collaboration has just been so key. Mm -hmm. uh, I think all the research shows that um, on multiple levels. Exactly. So if other teachers want to get involved, how do, is, is it, do you have to apply or how does it work? There is an application process, um, and it started as a three-year project. That was five years ago. Um, so actually, the ILC program itself is only running for one more year. And our focus right now is reaching rural areas, because we know we have our districts and our schools who don't have a lot of resources nearby. So how do you help support those teachers? But then also developing sustainability, so that when the ILC project itself goes away, how do we still keep that foot in and be involved in those professional development decisions and planning that goes on at the district level. Okay, terrific. Um, now let's go to the community level. Uh, Orea, you have been involved in the community coalition, um, very involved in the student equity needs index. I think a lot of people heard about that when it first you first proposed it, got instituted, but how is that, how is that working out? And, and explain how that works. So I'm really happy to be here and to be a part of this conversation. And I want to start by thanking the authors of the report um, because you did a really good job of lifting up the voices of students and parents uh, who, in, in my um, opinion, in our organization's experience, have been at the forefront of all of the educational um, uh, equity work and the fight for educational uh, justice. Um, the organization that I work for, Community Coalition, we're based in South Los Angeles, and we were founded in 1990 to deal with the impacts of the crack epi epidemic. And um, part of what the funder founders did from the very beginning was uh, emphasize that we had to organize high school age youth, African American and Latino youth. And we did that because we knew that it was going to take decades to undo the public and private disinvestment and the wide flight that South Los Angeles experienced. And so our young people and parents from our community have been very actively engaged when, um, you know, South LA felt the worst impacts of Prop 13. Our young people were at the forefront of the A through G campaign um, to get the LAUSD, the Los Angeles Unified School District, to adopt uh, A through G college prep courses as the default curriculum for all students because in South Los Angeles, what we found that even though the majority of students wanted to go on to college and a, and a university, um, the number one reason that students were not going to college was because they were missing one to three college prep courses. And so, you know, the state legislature said not all students are going to go on to college, so why do we need to offer college prep courses at all of the 
um, schools and black and brown parents organized and said, you know, actually we need to have high expectations. We need to see more rigor of all students um, in our community to really um, allow students and our families to make the choice. And so parents and students from South Los Angeles were a part of getting Prop 30 passed and they were very engaged in the local control funding formula um, conversations. And for the first time in, you know, in decades, we saw new revenue for public education. And for the first time, the governor um, you know, took a position that we weren't gonna penalize and punish children for uh, being poor and for experiencing uh, community issues like, you know, greater rates of violence or health issues like asthma, right? And so for us, um, this was a real opportunity to organize students and parents. Um, and we came in coalition with um, East Los Angeles and um, Inner City Struggle, an advancement project who is here in the room, uh, John Kim, you'll hear from him a little bit later. And we thought that it was this was a great opportunity for us to uh, bring light and illuminate uh, what living into equity with the local control funding formula, especially when you looked at concentration and supplemental funds that were generating for the LAUSD almost $1 billion um, a year um, for EL students, foster youth, and low-income students. And so we thought that this was an opportunity for us to marry organizing and the research and the data. And we worked together to build a student equity need index that really um, looked at academic indicators uh, that also took into account uh, community indicators because we believe that schools um, are a reflection of the community uh, that students attend and that we need to look at them as one and the same. And so the Student Equity Need Index also incorporates community indicators, expo uh, exposure to gun violence and asthma uh, rates. And for us, um, you know, the students and parents uh, um, led a, a campaign that focused on an inside and outside strategy where on the inside we were uh, really getting the LAUSD leadership to understand why this funding formula is a smart way of really targeting resources that benefit the students who generated um, the additional dollars and on the community side really creating uh, the uh, awareness and the education of why these new uh, targeted dollars would make a difference uh, mm -hmm. for high and highest need students in the LAUSD. And, and so did the, the, the board did allocate some funds to these schools that you identified as having the so greatest need? So in 2014 when it first passed, the school, the school district did not do a good job of implementing uh, the Student Equity Need Index um, uh, by applying dollars. We actually sued the district um, and got the uh, settled two years later, and they allocated 150 million to 50 highest need schools over three years, and that really helped to create the public awareness. Um, and in two, uh, in 2018, so last year, April um, of, uh, 8th, uh, 2018, students and parents organized, and they really focused on working with the school board members and uh, started with only two board members who were supportive of the equity index um, and um, actually got a unanimous vote uh, to adopt the index as the new funding formula, an updated index, um, and allocating $25 million to the, this current academic year and um, $263 million um, to uh, high and highest need schools starting um, in 2019-2020. So it comes with money, yes. Okay, well this is certainly something other districts could think about in terms of targeting those funds, even more specifically to the schools that really need the funds. So I, I want to go to your, your, your I don't know about partner in crime, but uh, uh, David Rattray <laughs> is uh, at the Chamber of Commerce. Uh, David, uh, you've been very involved in these reforms right from the beginning, and um, just wondering, uh, given your business experience and 
Could you highlight how the LCFF reinforces what you regard as important uh, lessons from the business world? Sure, um, but I want to take a moment, uh, just a tiny bit of privilege. I, you know, I have to say, um, this seems like an, inc an incredible moment that if, if we drew up a blank piece of paper and said, who are two of the greatest educators of our generation in the U.S.? It's Mike Kirst and Linda Darling Hammond. And to have Mike... <laughs> have Mike having served us now two tours of duty, but this last eight years with Linda at his side and and now have that torch passed directly to Linda. It's just a gift to me beyond my wildest imagination and hopes for California kids. So I just want to acknowledge again the, these two individuals. And they inspire so many of us, and I'm one of those that um, whatever sort of Mike and Linda tell me to do, that's what I do. Um, which is why I'm sitting here too, because Linda <laughs> said, get your butt up to Sacramento. <laughs> Um, so, to your question, um, Lewis, I, some of you know, but I was a business executive for about 20 years, and sort of classically trained, you might say, as an MBA, and um, tried to run a competitive company or companies. And um, I was able to retire young, um, white male privilege does that. And, um, and I started trying to help education, and, and I was sort of feeling like I was on I was on the shore wading into the ocean and education was on the, the wrong wave. You were on the wave going out and I was on the wave trying to come in. Because um, as I experienced in my business career, uh, we moved in the U.S. from an era that was kind of like the industrial age of management that was, you know, built, uh, built our economy in the 50s and 60s. It was, had characteristics like it was very bureaucratic, it was very autocratic, very top-down, heavy control of power at the top of companies, disempowerment at the front line. Um, we were hyper-competitive, we, we, we competed with external companies, but we also competed internally. Um, we were um, obsessed with carrots and sticks, you know, sort of the idea that People are not intrinsically motivated, and they need extrinsic motivation to, to perform well. Um, and uh, famously, uh, a CEO, most of you are probably too young, but Jack Welch, who was, uh, ran GE and was seen as one of the best CEOs in the US in the 70s and 80s, he believed in forced ranking and that you would rank every employee every year and you fire the lowest 10%, that that was some great leadership strategy, fire those bad employees every year. And in the 80s, as the Japanese, um, from uh, really taking a page from a great American uh, management consultant, uh, Deming, the Japanese really led with high-performing teams and positive work cultures and trying to create support for people on the premise that people were intrinsically motivated and great work cultures tapped into that intrinsic motivation and people brought their A game. And it was shocking to me when I found out as I moved into education, you were sort of, educators were taking the page out of the Jack Welch book. And I was like, no, don't do that. That's terrible. You know, with the API, AYP, the Casey, value added, uh, turnaround schools, it's just all negative reductive things. No wonder teachers didn't want to be in schools. I was like, come on, you know, these are like hostile work cultures. So to me, it's been so profoundly wonderful that Linda and Mike and so many of you have turned California into a place where we, we are pro-people. We are pro-teacher, we're pro-educator, we're pro-kids, and we're building positive work cultures. And that's what LCFF and LCAP and really replacing an, AY, an API, which is a reductive ranking set, uh, structure to uh, a dashboard that gives information so people can use their own inner wisdom and um, intrinsic motivation to work in teams. It's just so much more positive. The work's half done, and I think now the next eight years, we're gonna go to the high point on the hill for kids. I, I, I just ask, uh, just a quick follow-up, uh, David. 
we hear complaints from business community so often. Oh, we're not getting kids, we're not getting the labor force. Where well, we gotta import them. H1B is like this is just a key part of the whole Silicon Valley success story. Um, where do you see that debate, or I don't know, that, that dynamic? Are, are business, is the business community still complaining? Are we, are we doing what we need to do to get workers to, or students to the workplace better prepared? Well, I mean, it's, it's a natural tendency, I think, for any of us, whether it's the business community sort of blaming higher ed or higher ed blaming K-12, K-12 blaming early ed, to sort of sit back and say they, they weren't ready when they came to me. Um, I think the good news is more and more of us all are saying we're all in this together, and it's about collaboration, both hierarchical, you might say, as you progress through education into a workforce, but also horizontally as like the CUNY Coalition or other partners work together. Um, most business people that I deal with, um, they're amazed with the kids that we have in California and they know that they're lucky to have them come into their workplace. Um, and they need to get more engaged and not just sit back and wait until they graduate too. They need to work with uh, teachers and schools and help young people get internships and um, job shadowing and come in the classrooms as a business person throughout the whole developmental experience of a young person and not just sort of sit back and wait until they graduate college and then complain. You think this Governor Newsom's emphasis college from cradle to career is going to mean we're going to have to engage the business community even more in terms of that career piece of it? I think so, yeah. I think we're, we're we're in a big turn in California, and it's a really good turn, um, but we have a long way to go, and the business community needs to get far more engaged and be a true partner of cradle to career education. But I think those prospects are high. Okay, terrific. We, we have, a, we have a, a few questions I'm gonna ask the panelists. We can like, we, I think we have about 10 minutes and one minute answers. I'm asking you questions which really we could spend an hour answering, so <laughs> it's a challenge. Um, one question, there's been a lot of discussion about progress and continuing challenges within the K-12 system. What do you see as the relationship between closing education gaps and addressing the deep disparity, the disparities and opportunities outside of school? You want to, you want to take that? Uh, sure. Uh, and I'm just going to just adjust your mic one more okay. time. <laughs> I, can, I can see what the problem is there. Okay. Okay, hang on one second. Oh. I think that'll do it. <laughs> Guess I might challenge them. <laughs> okay. Okay, that's that should do it. Okay. You did it. Yeah. So, so to rephrase the question is what are we doing to mitigate the, the opportunity gaps outside of the school? Yes. Is that and, possible? Yeah, yeah, and, and it is possible. I, I think uh, more than ever, the opportunity gap is on that whole social emotional field. I think as schools, we need to rethink that academics along with the emotional and the social aspect is really critical. Uh, our students need to learn how to resolve conflict, how to work together as teams. Now at our district, we, we ha are investing 15 minutes a day to teach those specific skills of communication and collaboration explicitly to, to, to ensure that, that that index increases. We, we've actually tested our kids on social emotional intelligence. And one thing that we found out is that our kids, they feel lonely in school. They don't feel connected in school. They don't feel that an adult listens to them. So focus for this year has been how do we en en enhance that adult to student relationship. So I think that's one, one way to uh, mitigate those, those opportunity gaps, you know, that may happen. And I know the, there's a push now, uh, Governor Newsom to community schools, to, and that is supposed to address some of those broader issues. Uh, but 
Correa, quick, quick well, comment. I think um, later on, I, I know John Kim's going to talk about schools and communities first, but for us, there, there is definitely a need for more funding. Uh, we, uh, even Los Angeles Unified School District does not have, projects a deficit like in the next three years, right? And so there's a need for school funding, but California, we've done pretty good at taxing ourselves in other areas, whether it's you know to uh, build new parks, whether it's um, to uh, look at public safety, right? But we haven't done a good job of using formulas like the Student Equity Need Index to direct th those resources to communities that have a greater need. And so in Los Angeles, we're actually working um, with the Advancement Project uh, and LA Voice to get the um, um, board of Supervisors to adopt a justice equity need index that takes cost savings from Prop 47 and from us in, from California incarcerating less um, people, right, to target some of those cost savings to communities that are experiencing higher levels of violence. So we definitely have to have a community approach um, also to address need uh, where students are uh, experiencing other social issues outside of school. And remind us what Prop 47 is. Uh, so Prop 47, we classified major uh, felonies, so non nonviolent felonies, to misdemeanors, um, which um, allowed a lot of people to be released from prison, and we classify their felonies. Okay, terrific. Well, well not, another question I'm going to ask Mike and maybe uh, David Ratrack can jump in on this: Is anyone concerned about the growing pension liability? And how is it affecting school districts' <laughs> budgets now and going forward? Yeah. Uh, well, I would, obviously people are concerned about the pension liabilities. Uh, and I, I, I think that we, we need to reconsider some of the basic underlying factors there in terms of how long teachers need to work to get a pension or administrators, uh, what the style of the benefits can be. Uh, in, 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 in the future, uh, it, I don't think we're going to be and uh, should do much anything about the people that currently have contracts uh, for, for benefits, but I do think there needs to be a rethinking of, of, of the underlying assumptions and, and approaches that we've been taking in the past. So just jacking up the rates without any rethinking of, the, of, the, of some of the conceptual underpinnings, I think is, is not going to work over the long run. David Retra, any thoughts on this? Uh. Well, I think it does relate to the earlier points about funding education well. Um, when you fund something well and you try to create a great employer for people to want to work and teach, teach and teach for a lifetime, you give them a respectable pension and you have to fund that. It's just that simple. We underfunded that for a long time, so that's why we got ourselves behind the eight ball I think Jerry Brown did the right thing to say we need to start to fix, fix that and work with the legislature, but I think we overcorrected by putting too much burden on districts and not enough new money into the whole system. But I think that's the beginning. I think it's, these are long-term structural things you have to figure out, and we, we really didn't face them. But I, I think if we face them courageously and gradually over five or ten years and we put more money in the system for many things but that included these are solvable issues just uh, from the superintendent's level this pension issue is this a real oh it, it's grave it, it's undercutting the progress the potential the progress that we're seeing now um, with pension costs just skyrocketing is eroding um, many of the new LCFF dollars that, that we have received before, and, and it's going to continue to increase to 2021, 20, I believe, and we'll see from there. But it, it, it you know, when you, when you look at the amount of money, I believe is 70 cents per dollar goes in pension costs for every new dollar we receive. So that's significant. While I have you, I had a couple of questions about your master teacher um, program. I'm going to ask Danielle because this has also been an issue of pathways for teachers and really freeing them up to use their skills. What actually do they do, these master teachers? 
in, in the school? And uh, how often do they meet and train other teachers? Well, let me give you an, a, an example of a typical day. Uh, when teachers are in collaboration time, the master teacher may come in and uh, show resources out there to, to help teachers with um, creating assignments that are connected to the standards. Uh, during a typical day, the master teacher may be invited by a novice teacher to help, help with classroom management or how to teach a specific math skill. And either the master teacher will teach and the novice teacher will see or they will co-teach together as well. So there's different frameworks. It could be in a typical day that the master teacher may do a walkthrough with a team of teachers going from class to class, observing three things, looking at the learning environment, student actions, and teacher actions. And we have success criteria for each. And then the master teacher may also, along with teachers, provide future professional development opportunities as well. So those are three specific Let examples. Let me ask Daniel Letts, is this something you are in your network looking at? Oh. Or is that an opportunity for the master teachers in the districts you're working with? It's difficult. Um, I look at mine and we struggle with like trying to find the time to make it work because I'm in the classroom all day. So for me to be out of my classroom for even just an hour means somebody needs to be with my kids. Um, I'm fortunate that I have a very supportive administrator and if he can cover it or get somebody to cover it, he will. We have an instructional coach part-time. So every other week she's available. But again, you have to schedule her. So the scheduling becomes a huge issue. Um, two years ago, we did a mini lesson study with a group of teachers and the coordination that it took to get teachers released to go observe other teachers was enormous. Just the amount of conversations and who can do this and who could cover here and trying to coordinate all that. And that was for nine people. So I absolutely appreciate the idea of time and having that release time and the collaboration time because we don't have enough of that built into our days as it is. And teachers need that, to be able to go observe somebody, to go talk with somebody, to plan together, to review your data and, what, okay, what does this mean? Where are we going to go next? And we don't have that built in, in the general sense. Um, like I said, I'm fortunate where I'm at to have my administrator try to put in as much as possible, but between trying to get sub coverage or trying to get somebody else to cover there's all these things that are working against it just because of the way the system is currently designed. And I think if we had something built in place where you had those opportunities, I can't even imagine how powerful that would be for teachers. And then in turn, the students. Well, this relates very much to Mike Curse. I know this has been one of your concerns about the teaching. What how do we get professional development? So I'm going to have you do the last word. I did, I did want to just, we did get a question. Unfortunately, I don't have time to get into it. But the question, I think, suggests what the issue is. What role can high-quality high after-school and summer learning programs do? That, that's a key part of this whole cradle to career and dealing with some of those opportunity gaps. But, Mike, in terms of... Uh, your concerns about the, the teacher core and getting what they need to do the best possible work. And just in terms of what you thought, when you started out on this, I mean, to get these reforms in place in, a, in really a place that the state that really is a country, are you feeling, how are you feeling about that at, at right now, you know, as, <laughs> as you hand over the torch? <laughs> Well, I, I, in terms of California, I, I'm still very concerned about it. I think the LPI has, report has really the right directions. The scale of it and the time, uh, Ed Source did a really good article on are our teachers ready for the next generation science standards? This is a tremendous change uh, and uh, for particularly elementary and, and middle school teachers. We've overthrown the whole conceptual base of science now with a focus on not just content knowledge, but interdisciplinary knowledge, applying science. 
So here are these elementary teachers in their classroom, and here am I sitting in Sacramento, and we've done uh, English language arts, math, science, history. They're supposed to be do, do, doing much more civics uh, and health. So, uh, you know, I look at the typical elementary teacher and the, and the scope of what we have done in overhauling and rethinking what is most, uh, uh, what's, what do students need to know and be able to do. And so that, that's what I think we need to step back and, and my only uh, critique of the LPI report is it doesn't have the scale of it in it. It's just so big. If we were Rhode Island, we could get people in this room and solve these problems. But, you know, we have 350,000 or so teachers and administrators going up and uh, it's, it's really the scale of it is still, I think, for, yet for us to address. Quickly, one of the key issues on the table is more money for schools. And I know you, have, I've heard you've expressed from frustration, but this comes up in almost every conversation. And uh, there's no easy fix to this, but do you think we need more money? I mean, because we already, as, as Governor Newsom pointed out, the prop 98 money went from 47 billion seven years ago to 80 billion next year. That's, that's a, it's yeah. not chump change. Yes, we do need more money. I would point out that we were in the 40s. If you don't adjust for costs, and I'll come back to costs, we went from the 40s to near the national average. Where you're chasing your tail is the housing costs go up too fast. And, you know, teachers and administrators have to live somewhere. So, you know, then we adjust for the costs, and, uh, and, and we find we drop down to 41st. So, uh, we, as long as the cost pressures are so high, uh, then in terms of housing and living costs, we, need, we definitely need a, a, a generation model. It's got to be on the revenue side. So let's see what happens in, two, uh, in 2020 on uh, the amendment to Prop Transition 13 on, on uh, business and commercial property. If, uh, we, we, the states that are ahead of us have a three-stool system, federal, state, local. We essentially have a federal and state system. The local property tax is taxed locally and brought into Sacramento and we recirculate it. So when you read that we have property tax, yeah, but we control it through the, fa uh, the finance formulas in Sacramento. So if we, I don't, I don't really know how to do it without getting local taxation back or extending uh, taxes to services, more services uh, in, that, in that regard, because the, the sales tax is just on hard goods, and, and uh, that's a model from 30, 40 years ago. So those two big parameters, getting local flexibility on property taxation or extending state sa taxes to services, I think those are probably there. I, we may have milked the income tax as much as we can. There may be more to do there. Well, on, on that note, we're hoping that Mike Kirst, we, we're counting on him staying involved in California education, but I really wanted to thank, I mean, the five people here, this is what makes all of this work. This is why we are making progress and makes me optimistic that we can actually get to the goals that we're all striving for. A big round of applause for our panel. Thank you, thank you so much for the design. Thank you. It was really fun uh, hearing from you. Okay, good morning, everyone. I'm Roberta Ferger, senior writer and director of storytelling for the Learning Policy Institute. Uh, we're fortunate to have another group of dynamic and engaged panelists to help frame this next conversation, which is focused on next steps for California policy. Before we get started, I want to introduce our guests. First to my left, Heather Huff. Heather is the executive director of PACE, Policy Analysis for California Education. PACE produced the recent Getting Down to Facts two studies and will share with us some of the key findings of those studies. Rucker Johnson, to her left, um, is an associate professor in the Goldman School of Public Policy at UC California, Berkeley. He specializes in the economics of education with a focus on the impacts of poverty and inequality on life chances. Rucker will share about his study on the impact of LCFF on student outcomes and also the policy implications for that study. John Kim is the executive director of the Advancement Project, 
a statewide organization whose work is focused on prioritizing the needs of marginalized communities. The Adv Advancement Project is also part of a coalition that is advancing a new revenue initiative here in California, which John will tell us a bit about. Next is Tom Armolino. Tom is Executive Director of the California Collaborative for Educational Excellence. In his role, Tom is really at the center of the state's effort to create a coherent system of support. And we'll hear a bit about that today as well. And last but not least, Assembly Member, Member Patrick O'Donnell. As chair of the Assembly Education Committee, Assemblymember O'Donnell has a unique vantage point on policymaking in the state, as he and his staff review many of the education bills that come before the legislature. We look forward to his comments as well. So welcome again. One note, um, as with the previous panel, you have cards on your table, and if you have questions that come up during the conversation, please jot them down, and one of my colleagues will pick them up and we'll get to at least a few of them before the end. So first, Heather, for you. Research has played a pivotal role in education policy making in California, both identifying need and also assessing progress. In September, PACE released Getting Down to Facts 2, 36 research studies analyzing a range of issues from the pre-K pre to 12 continuum. To set the stage for this panel, tell us a little bit about the top three to five priorities that were elevated in those studies. <clears throat> Happy to. Um, so across all of these studies and all of these researchers that were brought together to take stock of where we had been and start to lay out some of the paths, the potential paths forward for the new administration, uh, we identified a couple of key points. The first is that we have seen progress, that we've made big investments in K-12 education, and that there's reason to believe that we're on the right track. As uh, my colleague to the left will describe in a minute, there's some evidence that there are positive changes in student outcomes, but also there's broad stakeholder support for the kinds of changes that we've put into place, the common core standards, new testing, the local control funding formula, the LCAP process. But we have a really long way to go to fully realize these opportunities as we've been discussing this morning. Uh, and there's a couple of key places. So one is that we've been making investments in K-12, but we have not been making as strong investments in early childhood. And the, where we see that then as our students progress through the K-12 system is that our schools are actually doing a pretty good job of accelerating student achievement. But when students step into our public system in kindergarten, the achievement gap is already so large that our schools aren't able to close that gap. And that just really points to the need to invest in the early childhood system and really to create a system where currently California does not have one compared to other states. But even in the K-12 system, we have a very important need to build capacity for the kinds of improvement that we want to see happen. The shift from no child left behind from the API to where we're at now is really a shift to a continuous improvement approach. It's every person in the system from the teacher to the principal to the people who work in the school district to everyone at the state and our various state agencies play a particular role in driving improvement. And it's a very different role than when somebody said, your school isn't doing well, do this instead. We want people to be making decisions about how to invest their money and to be able to evaluate whether those investments have been effective. And that's a big mindset shift, it's a big structural shift, and that capacity needs to be built at all of the levels of the system. Uh, and the last piece, which we've also discussed today, is around funding. We do not have enough funding in the system, and we also have big issues that haven't been attended to yet, such as pensions, such as special education funding and finance governance. Those things need to be addressed quickly in order for us to continue to move forward, building the capacity to make use of all of the opportunities that we've been given in California. Thanks so much. One quick follow-up question. Um, you touched on this a little bit, but where is there consensus around next steps from a policy perspective? And in what areas do we need more research to really help inform next policy steps? Great question. So I'll um, advertise this brief that we just wrote, uh, connecting the getting down to facts research to the governor's budget. I would say that there's broad consensus in the broad strokes. 
Um, where there's not consensus is in where we, how we're going to make these changes. So while I think that there's a, a very general sense that early childhood is a place we need to invest, some of the tensions that are still being discussed are when we talk about early childhood, are we talking about seats? Are we talking about access? Or are we talking about quality? And those are two different conversations, and we need to be having both of those conversations simultaneously. I think across any of these issues, there are also, there are similar types of conversations. Everyone agrees that the pension liability is a huge issue. It's fantastic that we're putting some money as a state toward paying that down and relieving pressure for districts, but how are we going to solve the structural problem that got us there? And a lot of these solutions are not easy in any way. They're going to require a lot of coalition building, a lot of political will. One of the getting down to fact studies estimated that we need a third more funding in order to adequately fund our schools. And that's still less than what some northeastern states provide. How are we going to get there? What are we going to do as a state that will actually help us to make that investment? Mm -hmm. And what about areas for more research? Um, are there areas that really we need to expand our knowledge from a research perspective in order to inform policy next steps? There are always, I mean, I'm a researcher, so it's, a, it's an easy question. Uh, but yes, there are always areas where we need more research. I think that there, there are a couple of areas where we know we have needs uh, in terms of understanding how we should move forward on implementing system. One of the areas that comes to the forefront in many conversations I'm having is around special education, that we've moved special education into the forefront of our accountability system. And now we've shined a flashlight onto the performance of those students. And there are lots of questions about how we make sense of the accountability data, what kinds of actions are needed to best support those kids in school and when they leave our public education system. And then I think as we begin to implement new policies, there's always a critical need for research and evaluation that helps us know if we're actually accomplishing the things that we are trying to accomplish. And in order to do that, of course, we need a really rock solid data system that helps us to learn about whether we're making the progress that we hope to. Thank you. Uh, Rucker, keeping with the theme of research, your research with Sean Tanner really provides the first analysis of the effects of LCFF and specifically the increase in resources and spending flexibility on student outcomes. Can you share with us the key findings from that work? Yeah, thank you. Well, I'm, I'm delighted to be here. I want to thank <clears throat> first um, all of you, the educators in the room who are just their dedication for excellence and equity and access in our, our schools. Um, certainly LPI and Linda and Louise Lewis, um, just in terms of uh, engaging this conversation. I think that when, when I think about the issues regarding um, access, I think it's important to frame where we started. In other words, the Great Recession really in school inequality, really in terms of resources, really increased um, following the recession. And it required really, I mean, we're talking about like across the country, 300,000 teachers and personnel laid off. We're talking about 20% cuts in budgets. Um, and it really, uh, on the eve of LCFF being passed, we still hadn't really meaningfully recovered from that. And so LCFF, when you think about what three major school reforms that this particular period encompasses, it's LCFF, it's the um, increases in state-funded pre-K and transitional kindergarten, and, and then it's the new systems of support. And these three are really taking head on the student achievement gaps that are really some of the pressing issues. And these three policies with the LCFF dealing with the disparities in funding, the um, transitional pre-K and investments dealing with the gaps in school readiness on kindergarten entry. Um, and then the third about the new systems of, of support is really about targeting um, kind of targeted supports for district uh, improvement efforts. 
and, and really trying to build that out. Now, the reason I mention all three is because it's really the synergies between these three that really hold the promise of going the next mile and really kind of building these connections. So what do we do um, in the interest of time? We, we, we use um, annual data from 1995 through 2017 at the very detailed district uh, finance data and link it to the student level achievement to try to really be among the first studies to document the impacts on student success. And to kind of really isolate the causal effects of spending, we compare the changes in average student outcomes across cohorts from the same schools before and after the LCFF induced increases in spending. And what we're able to document is that these impacts don't happen overnight, but rather there's a kind of exposure, a dose response that with each increasing year of exposure to the increased resources. The first point is if these resources don't make it to the classroom, well, we shouldn't be expecting to see student improvement outcomes. So if a lot of it is going to the pension in, in the future, some of the successes I'm talking about now will definitely be undermined. But what we do find in this particular period, we're talking about the first three or four years of the, of the rollout of LCFF, we're seeing increases in instructional expenditures, increases in teacher salaries, albeit today marked the first day of the teacher strike in my kids' school in Oakland Unified. But th that being said, it's reductions in class size, we're seeing those things occur. And that, that is then translating into increases in high school graduation rates, increases in student high school uh, math and reading. And in particular, we're talking about a $1,000 increase experienced consecutively in 10th, 11th, 12th, so throughout the high school years, is leading to about a 5.9% increase in high school graduation rates. And similarly, we're seeing significant boosts in numeracy and literacy, so that a $1,000 increase experienced in four consecutive years, eighth grade, ninth grade, 10th grade, 11th grade, that by 11th grade is then leading to a 0.19 standard deviation increase in math achievement. Now you might think, well, what is that? We're talking about that's equivalent to about seven months of learning. And it's about equivalent to about 38% of the average um, poor, non-poor achievement gap. So these are significant progress. Now, what you want to contextualize this is that Sean Reardon and others have documented that California students, particularly middle income and lower, middle, lower income students, are about a whole grade level behind their peers in other states. And so what that means, a whole grade level behind, is that these gaps are closing via these investments and they require sustainment. Now, just to kind of capitalize on some of the points that Heather made when we kind of relate to what's the way forward, because I know I'm short on time, they're pulling the plug, but just a couple points that kind of put some empirical clothing around the, the issues around what's needed to further the success. These gaps of being a whole grade level behind peers in other states is already apparent at kindergarten. And what that means is that we need a more robust investment on the pre-K and transitional kindergarten to ensure that those investments in school readiness can be augmented. So the, the, the four elements of that that kind of require some serious interrogation in terms of how we deal with this is that we have both um, see, less than half of three and four-year-olds currently attend quality pre-K programs statewide. We have a issue with regard to the funding with which, um, let's see, it's something on the order of a third of the median single parent's budget is consumed with childcare costs. Remember that basically 58% of childcare and preschool uh, workers are actually receiving public assistance. So we're talking about low wages. We're talking about actually they're not getting a lot of the training pieces to ensure high quality programs. And then what you want to remember is that low income children, 90% of low income children in unlicensed uh, childcare settings, 90% of the children in those are low income. So quality and access are part of that. Mm -hmm. Now, the reason I mention all of this is because the synergies between pre-K and K-12 investments have to be thought of in concert. And in other work, we're documenting that basically when those things are done together 
and in concert that the total impact is much greater than the sum of the parts. And because I'm way out of time and probably way over my budget, thank you, I will, be, I will stop. No, that's great. So we're hearing duration and, and time, right? This, yes. These investments need to continue. And also we need to think in a unified way about the pre-K to 12 continuum. Um, John, you know, the research shows, um, as Rutgers talked about and Heather, is that the gaps in opportunities and outcomes are closing, um, but they still persist. And we also know that there's an ongoing need for more funding. We've heard that quite a bit, more equitably spent to continue to close those gaps. So John, a key question is, how do we generate these resources? And I know the Advancement Project is part of a coalition advancing sure. an initiative on the 2020 ballot. Can you tell us a little bit about that effort? Sure. Uh, so good morning, everyone. I want to make sure this mic works. Uh, you get a sense of how talented Janet Jackson really is when you have to work with one of these, so I appreciate that. Um, so you kind of can't do this work without becoming a fan of history um, and looking back at sort of how decisions were made, who really made them, and for what reason, um, and sort of how we got here at this particular point. Um, at the Advancement Project California, one of the things that we're pretty clear about is that the political ecology of California has shifted such that the old modes of fighting for justice uh, have to be updated some, right? So it's no longer that old school battle between a pure good on the outside and a pure evil on the inside, right? It's no longer the Dr. King, versus the Bull Connor kind of fights, right? Um, we've seen a lot of shifting in terms of who are running our school districts, who are running our cities, who's running our state. Um, and many of them are our friends. Uh, and so as opposed to looking for bad actors, uh, what we find more fruitful and more impactful is to look for where biases from generations ago had been baked into systems, and how do we now root out the ghosts in those machines, okay? Uh, and when you look back in history, you can find no scarier ghost, no bigger ghost uh, in our machine than Prop 13. Okay, now I remember uh, I was three years old when Prop 13 passed, and I remember thinking, what the hell are you guys thinking passing Prop 13? <laughs> I'm just kidding, I, didn't, I was three, come on. <clears throat> All right, um, so you know, if the, today's panel is about scaling up and sustaining equity, 40 plus years ago, there was probably a similar conversation, maybe a room like this, uh, that actually their point was, how do we scale and sustain inequity? And their answer was Prop 13, okay? So when we think about the reform of Prop 13 that com is coming up, and let's be clear, it's not maybe qualified, it has qualified. Uh, it qualified in December, it's gonna be on the ballot unless something dramatic happens, but it's gonna be the first thing that you see after all the candidate votes going to be the first thing that you see to reform this thing for 40 years that has put one arm behind our back in terms of our state getting ready for the future, right? Um, and so when I think about it, I think about the $11 billion that could be coming in, sure, that's going to be huge, but I also think about what story we're telling the future, right? Uh, what kind of state are we going to be? Because in 1978, the signal to me and my generation was that this state was going to only be golden for some people, not for all of us, okay? And what we're saying here is either by race or by generation or by class, there was gonna be lines cut and people who got theirs are gonna hold on to theirs from 1978 onward and then everybody else, good luck. And so what we're looking at now moving forward is a proposition that actually opens those things up. Now let's be clear, the campaign was an excellently run campaign in 1978. They had three layers, right? Grandma's home, you don't want grandma to lose their home. Uh, there was underlying and underpinning of racial appeals that, you know, the hordes of black, brown, and Asian people are going to come take yours, so let's lock that off, okay? But really the big thing underneath all of that was that corporate interests were designing it in a way so that they could have loopholes and get away with having to pay their fair share, okay? Three layers of the campaign cake. The third one many people didn't know about, okay? And all this campaign in 2020 is going to do is get rid of that third layer. Grandma's home is not touched. None of our homes will be touched. And if anybody tries to tell you that, they have probably got a bridge to sell you as well, okay? What we're looking at is basically how do we say, hey, big corporations, right? You've gotten by 40 years without having to pay your fair share. Now it's time to kick in so we can all live into the future as a state. 80% of the new revenue from our estimate will come from 8% of property owners, of commercial property owners. 
Okay, so it's really the sort of billionaire, millionaire corporate class that we're looking at that we need to have them pay their fair share. And for the economists in the room, it means that we're not so overly reliant on just one type of tax in terms of personal property tax, I'm sorry, personal tax, um, but we're talking about actually the getting some, building some equity in the tax on the buildings that we, we, we are in, the places that we stand, the land that we stand on, okay? And so that's what the campaign is about. Um, <clears throat> let me just end by saying this. Uh, of the 11 billion, uh, first, that's estimates of a few years old, so that number might go up as we move along. Um, what we're looking at is a 40-60 split of the revenue. 40% of that would go to K-12 and community colleges. 60% of that would go back into local jurisdictions like counties and cities and special districts, including fire departments, right? And we need that. Um, of the 40% for education dollars, it will sit on top of Prop 98 dollars, and it will be pooled into a state fund that will be distributed using sort of the equity principles of LCFF as well, okay? And so we're looking at $11 billion, 40% of it being distributed to K-12 uh, and community colleges using equity as a principle. Um, and the last thing I'll say is this, um, we're in an unprecedented position with this campaign. We've qualified nearly two years in advance of the actual vote. No proposition has done that before, okay? We have two years to build momentum, to educate the public. <clears throat> there are people in this room that actually were not born when Prop 13 was passed. Um, I was three, but some people were not yet born. Um, and so we're gonna be, have to do a lot of public education. Uh, but the momentum is building. The momentum is extraordinary. And every time, unfortunately, one of our school districts has a strike, it reignites the public conversation about what we haven't been doing for our schools. And the answer to that <clears throat> very hard question a lot of time ends up, we need to reform Prop 13. <clears throat> Right? And so we're very excited about the momentum that's being built. The campaign is growing. The coalition is growing. And so we're really excited to, to have to lock arms with everyone in this room to figure out how we make this change. Thank you. So John, a quick follow-up. Um, one of the getting down to facts studies that Heather referenced um, said that it would take another $25 billion over 2016-17 spending to um, ensure that all students had a chance to meet the goals set by the state. We're not going to get to that number overnight. Um, so how do we keep advancing equity even while achieving adequacy in funding remains a work in progress? Sure. Um, so one story I, I think of a lot is we were doing these community mapping sessions in South LA. I don't know if it was with our partners Community Coalition or may have been Urban League. And there was one young boy, he was maybe 12, and he told the story of uh, the bus stop was about five blocks away from campus. And however heavy his backpack was, and this is not a big kid, you know, thin little legs, he would have to run as fast as possible to get to campus. Right, because he had to avoid dangerous streets, dangerous gangs, and just all these other conditions in that community, okay? Now, I worry if my kid is mad at me as I'm dropping her off at school, if, how she's gonna do at school. But this kid here, who has to run for his dear life, right, to get to campus, you know, what, how, what are his chances to really succeed in that classroom? And so one of the things that I think we need to be thoughtful about is what can we do on school campuses in the classroom and what is the ecology that we need to be building around some of these students that are based on just the whole kid, the whole family, and the whole community? We really appreciate this administration thinking about the whole child, but we also have to really be thoughtful about how do we also think about the juvenile justice system and how that gets reformed in parts of South LA? Uh, how about fresh fruits and vegetables? How about parks? How about all these things? And the thing about the schools and communities first reform on 2020 is that it'll do work on that other side of the ledger as well. Right? It'll do work in terms of how counties can reform what these communities look like and not just what's going on in the classrooms. And so I think we have to stop, we were doing a good job thinking systemically about equity, but how do we start thinking ecologically about equity and about how we bring all these fights together because it may cost 25 billion if it was just the schools alone that was gonna tackle all these challenges. It may be less and more leverageable if we have all parts of our sort of governance working on this at the same time. Thank you. So leveraging the whole system to advance the whole child. Tom, the research is clear, and we heard this a bit 
from Laura during her presentation of the need for capacity building at every level of the system. Um, in the latest dashboard release, for example, nearly 400 districts were identified for targeted assistance through this eight-byte system of support. The California Collaborative for Educational Excellence is going to play a pivotal role, plays a pivotal role in that system. Can you share with us um, your plans for connecting districts with the support they need to improve student opportunities and outcomes? Sure. Yeah, and, and as the other panelists have said, thank you for this opportunity. And thank you to the folks in the room that really here care about children. One of the things that I've experienced in this role, I'm in my eighth, eighth month on the job now, so uh, is there is passion for kids everywhere. Everywhere I go, when we sit in, in schools and anywhere we go in groups, folks are really focused around trying to figure out how are we gonna do a better job for the children that we're tasked with serving. For those that don't know much about the, the California Collaborative for Educational Excellence, we're in our fourth year of existence in the first uh, three years, and when we, we came along with LCFF, during that time, we didn't have dashboard data. We didn't have multiple years of data. We had new assessments. So during that first three years, uh, my predecessor, Dr. Carl Cohn, had lots of opportunities to experiment a little bit, and opportunities to kind of go in and try to think about how could we make a difference? How could we build capacity? And so the work that we have been doing over the past three years, what I can tell you is some of that is ending, some of that's changed. In, in particular, where it's changing is because of the data that we have now. So when you mentioned the 400 schools now that have been identified, um, those, those are those 400 districts that have been identified. In our role in particular, when we were developed, the, the statute says that we were developed to advise and assist school districts, charter schools, and county offices, in particular around helping them implement their LCAP. In addition, that language now has changed and also talks about our role in being able to participate in what we now call the newest accountability system, the system of support. That is a key role that we are playing now in particular. So if you, and there's a handout, I don't know if it's on your, your desk or not, but you will see these, I don't expect you to read it, but you can look, you can see there's a model. I encourage you to look at this model in particular, and it really defines our new system. And our new system of support, our role in particular in that is, is that the system now has been developed. The system is focused on local control, and, and you'll you notice with these concentric circles is that everything leads back to the district. And then it takes the next layer out, and county offices in particular are designed and they receive funding to be that first level of support for school districts. The next level out now are these new, what we call these geographic leads, which are county offices as well, who have some expertise in particular to make sure they're throughout the state that, they, that every county office throughout these various geographic regions has the capacity to serve the districts that they're asked to serve. So what we know about county offices, and I know them well, I was a former county superintendent, is, is that every county office is different, just like every district is a little bit different. Some have more capacity than others based on size in particular. And so these geographic leads have this responsibility to make sure that they're, whatever the district need may be, that they can then be able to provide a resource maybe that their current county office doesn't have that ability. Then in addition to that, there's a, a variety of other leads that have been funded in the state. There are equity leads, there are community engagement initiative that is new this year, there are new SELPA leads, there are math leads, there are a variety of other leads who are received funding who have some particular expertise in an area. These geographic leads are intended to be able to make sure that they have access to those and know what those resources are and so that they can make sure that if a district has that need, they can get that. The example I always use is that <clears throat> where I was from in Shasta County, Shasta County was a very white county. We were very poor, but we had very few EL students. So as a county office, that was not a resource that I, I tended to have. When we had EL students who came in in a district that had some um, needs that needed to be served, I would often look to Butte County. So Butte had more of a migrant ed program. We would look to them. We were colleagues. I would look to the county superintendent. We had a relationship and we would share some resources. That's not the case everywhere. Now what would happen is, is that if there was a district in Shasta County who had that same need, yes, they, we could look to Butte. We could also look to our geographic lead. We could also look to the other geographic leads we could also look to the new the, the EL lead in particular to make sure that the district gets that resource. That's how the system is built. 
part of our role in particular is working with the Department of Ed is to actually help manage that, actually help bring these folks together. Last week we had a meeting with 80 folks in the room with all the leads in the room, all talking about, okay, how are we gonna make this system work? How can we make sure that we get that resource down to a district and that any district, if you're in MODOC or if you're in LA, you would have that same ability. So a large part of our role is shifting to be around focused around the system of support. Another key role that's new this year, we've always had the ability, the state superintendent has always had the ability to assign us to a district. So if there was a district in the state that they felt had some academic needs, the state superintendent could say, the CCE would like you to go in and provide some assistance. That happened last spring for the first time in Inglewood Unified. So Inglewood, if you don't know Inglewood Unified, they have been under state receivership for the last seven years, which means they have a state loan. They've lost over 8,000 students during that time, over half of their students during that time. State superintendent reached out to us and said, we'd like you to go in and see if you can assist this district in the academic issues or needs that they may have. In addition, we had in Vallejo, so Vallejo City Unified also reached out to us. So the superintendent raised her hand and said, we would really like some support. We reached out to the county office. We asked the state superintendent to assign us there because when we're assigned, we can use our resources to help them. Then in the fall, AB 1840 was developed. So we're now, the state law has now changed to where if any district goes in receivership, we are automatically assigned to go in and do some work in that district. So that's four districts right now in the state. So we are now getting prepared to have conversations in Oakland, also in South Monterey, and so we now have this ability to where we're going in alongside the county office and the state department and other folks and sitting with that district and trying to figure out what it is that we can do to academically help them to try, try to create some systems and some supports to help them academically. What's unique about that is, is that when these districts in the past have always had academic issues, there's not a district in the state that's gone into receivership that didn't have academic issues, right? That shouldn't surprise any of us, right? They have a lack of resources. Um, so I think in maybe the next question, I can share a little bit about some of what we've kind of seen as we've gone in there and where, where some of those concerns are. Yeah, you know, one of the things you mentioned when we were talking before today was that both in that one-on-one -on -one support for a district, but also statewide, the importance of relationships that often haven't existed in the past. And I wonder if you can speak to that um, as you think about the, the challenges ahead, um, but the role of relationships there. Yeah, it's, it's, this shouldn't be unique to any of us either. Education is a pretty isolated system, right? We are trying to change that system. This whole system is for everybody kind of working together, collaborating together to try to, to make some differences. You heard the superintendent earlier in Chula Vista talk about collaboration and then you heard the example of the teacher where teachers are coming together. I can remember as a district soup when we first started to work on collaborating, I had teachers come to me and say, I don't wanna work with that teacher, right? I had some folks go, I got things to do. I got my kids to work with. And that was time away from that. They didn't see that. They didn't see that that could actually be a resource to help them get better. So we had to really make sure that we brought them together that we provided opportunities to develop trust. We provided opportunities with some systems to help them. So for example, when they came together to make sure that we had some data in front of them. We had opportunities for them to do some lesson study. We had to kind of put some systemic practices in place to help them with that piece. In our work in particular, what we're finding is, is that districts and folks are working in isolation often, right? They work, they're used to trying to solve these problems on their own, right? And so one of the, the the, which is very interesting is, is that even with our work is some, some folks invite us in, right? And other opportunities we get invited in. In the very beginning, everybody's a little bit suspect on can we trust each other and what are you going to do? Are you going to create more work? How are you going to help, from, help me? This mindset also is still an issue with folks, even around this idea of differentiated assistance and when county offices now are expected to work with the district, the district's mindset see that in the old system is, a status, there's something wrong, you're gonna come in and tell me that I have to do something different, and then hopefully you're gonna leave, right? And they don't see that as a mindset that it actually could be a resource to come to the table to try to be able to help them and look together and try to identify some root causes, put some strategies in place and be a resource to help them. Thank you. Assembly Member O'Donnell, we've heard a little bit about, in this panel and the previous one, the 
the ways in which local districts and their teachers and their communities are embracing the shift from a state, more state-focused control to local control, um, giving districts the ability to devise solutions and budget and plan budgeting um, in ways that reflect their local context. Um, how do you see the legislature balancing this important, its important policy-making role within a local control framework, particularly as it relates to developing new policies and programs? Thank you, and thank you for the opportunity to be here. Um, I think first we need to look back when we talk about local control and what, what local control isn't. Uh, my background is that of a classroom teacher, 22 years, teaching middle and high school. And I can remember, especially at the K-8 setting, walking into classrooms at you know, 2.24 in the afternoon, and every student would have to be sitting on a number on, 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 a, on a piece of carpet. Uh, there would be scripted learning going on, open court, remember the open court days. Um, of course, all in the name of closing the achievement gap, but I think we know that micromanagement from Sacramento, my, trying to micromanage the classroom from, from Sacramento doesn't work. We tried it, it didn't work. So what did we do? With the help of many people in this room, Dr. Kirsch, I see you there, um, we came up with, with a local control funding formula. And I'm probably one of the chief supporters of local control in the state capitol. Uh, I sit as the chair of the education committee and I can tell you I will see a number of bills this year that are going to come forward that seek to micromanage the classroom from Sacramento. Uh, there will be bills that seek to reestablish our old categorical scheme wherein we had those 20 or so streams of funding. Uh, there will even be bills that say every school has to start at this time or later. Those are the kinds of things I really push back on because we did that. It didn't work. Uh, I, I, I am very supportive of the model of saying, hey, here's the bar, here are the resources, too few, granted too few, but here are the resources, now meet that bar. And so really my role, I, as I see it, and I bring my classroom experience uh, uh, to Sacramento, is to protect that local control funding formula and give it some time to saturate throughout California. Listen, we have 1,000 school districts, 10,000 schools in the state of California. We shouldn't de be designing how they all act from the Sacramento level. So taking that a little bit further, we've heard um, about, both about the advances and about the challenges that, that exist. And I'm curious if you can talk a little bit about how you see working within the legislature to strengthen the reforms that have put, put in place um, and really provide that runway for the next 10 years. Yeah, um, well, let's always educate and activate. Uh, we, get new, we get new members every two years in the state legislature, sometimes in between, and my job, is often to sit down with them individually because they're going to come up with a bill. Everybody wants to do an education bill because they all think they have to do something. They have an example of a, of a program that's working in their local district and they say, hey, every district in the state should do this. Let me tell you about it. And it's my job to say, wow, that is a great idea. You should keep doing it. Your district should keep doing it. And maybe you should share it. But it doesn't necessarily have to be state law that every district uh, implements the same type of program. So really, my, my role is first to educate people, and then when it comes to the committee level, you know, it, is, it is a political environment, and I have to be, you know, sometimes very uh, forceful, and I'm not afraid to hit the red button uh, when something comes up and to kill a bill that I think is going to be detrimental to, uh, to the local control concept. Well, thank you. I just want to remind folks at their tables, if you do have questions, um, feel free to Put your hand up and someone will pick them up. For, for all of the panelists, so just jump in if you feel so moved, um, we've really heard from a diversity of voices today. And that diversity of engagement we know is going to be key to sustaining and deepening the work that's been started. How do we continue to build the capacity of all stakeholders, from the students and parents and families to the educators in the classroom and the district and state level folks um, to really be full participants in local control funding formula. Can I jump in? So I just want to jump in on a few of the points that speak to that. I think one of the things that I think the state's emphasis on local control, I think a cautionary note is that it will fail if we don't adjoin it with data systems that can inform what's working, why it's working, so that we can replicate successes and we can build a district's capacity to inform and it be a spillover to learning and innovation. Innovation, random acts of innovation that 
aren't portable are really not so helpful. So I think that's an important piece. Another piece is to remember that in work I've done previously, healthier children are better learners. And it's important to recognize that our physical health and mental health services are actually, pro the provision of them in our California school system is among the lowest in the country. And that's actually an important part of whether it be absenteeism, asthma, and other things that affect learning outcomes to have the kind of wraparound services. So certainly other people can speak on. Yeah, I'll, I'll jump in on that, sorry, as well. I, we had a paper in getting down to facts on stakeholder engagement and community engagement. One of the things that I think is critical <coughs> is educating those stakeholders on what this process looks like and how it's different. In the same way that we're talking about the mindsets around continuous improvement needing to be there for educators, for policymakers, it's also true for parents, communities, and school boards. I totally agree with what you said about the data that in order for parents and communities to advocate for what works under what conditions, they need to know how to push for that kind of evaluation and how to be consumers of that kind of evaluation. And it's only then that we can actually engage those people in realizing the vision of true stakeholder engagement, which is not, I read an article about this thing, so now I'm going to push for it, or my kid needs something different, although there's a place for that as well. But how can the community come together to be a player at the table in pushing the equity agenda? Great, John. So before I uh, started doing this kind of work, I played a lot of music and I was in a lot of bands. Um, and one of the things that you learn quickly is that there are those people that want to get out there and shine on their own. And then those people that want to be a part of the a band and make a big sound all together. Um, and one of the things that we found in, in places that we do um, our advocacy is the greatest flywheel for change is when everybody sees themselves as being part of a band and everyone sees himself being a part of a conversation and that there's sort of, sort of this sort of shared voice and power, right? So let me say, give you one quick example. When we passed with Coco and ICS that CENI idea and LAUSD. Tell people what CENI the, is. The Student reminded. Equity Need Index, which we had just talked about. Um, that campaign was about five years. Uh, LAUSD had five superintendents in that same time frame. Okay, LAUSD had this sort of revolving door of superintendents, and there was one moment after we had passed the resolution that a superintendent was like, what are we talking about? What do you mean, setting? What is that? And so it was up to the community to bring that conversation back in and say, oh, actually, you all had passed this. Let's figure out how to improve it, so on and so forth. And so how do we build out voices, not just within the isolated space of school classrooms uh, and, you know, the the administration or the, even the school board members, but also in terms of community engagement, how do we get parents, how do we get community groups in there? Because unless that whole band is playing together, you know, it's gonna start sounding pretty off pretty quickly. And so I worry this experiment with local control very much hinges on capacity on the inside and outside, and we don't think enough about that outside capacity. Great. So, I think the thing about capacity is to first recognize where is the incapacity, right? So, one of the things that we found is that, in particular with the districts that are really struggling, is that when we go in there, we've been asked to do what they call these systemic academic reviews. What we found is they have multiple plans. There's not a lack of plans. There's an LCAP, but the LCAP is not an actionable LCAP. It's very large. It's something that only maybe the district office level folks exists. Often they have a strategic plan. The strategic plan is because the LCAP's not working for them. Some of them have other reports from like the fiscal crisis management assistance team. Some have studied their special ed issues. They have these multiple things that exist. And what we try to do is really take a look at systemically, what are the systemic practices that exist and what are the ones that do not exist? And then determine where is, where is that, that capacity lacking and then try to figure out how you can fill that hole. So I think that, that's a main piece and that in any piece of work that we're doing, you know, we've been really trying in particular over these first three years to try to measure, have we changed the practices in the field and, and can it be sustainable? So when we leave now, right, we were intended to do some work. Have you have folks been able to use those resources and be able to take those and continue doing them? And in particular, if you study the improvement science model, it talks about that you're really trying to have folks learn to improve instead of learn to perform. So the difference there is, is actually understanding the 
plan, do, study, act model, these short cycles, and actually going in and trying to understand how you actually improve something, right? Learn how to improve something. Then once you're able to do that, take that and be able to scale that out, right? Where what folks generally do is they attack a certain thing and they go after that thing. And we get asked for that a lot where you give us some resources to go after this one thing, but it's not with any real coherence. So there is no capacity built because you do it and maybe you get a little bit of growth and then we move on to the next thing and it's not something that's sustainable. And I, I, yeah, I, I think the, the challenge I have from the Sacramento level is when we talk about that capacity and that, 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 that need to improve, you know, how do we drive it from the state legislature? And that's a very difficult question to answer because we really can't. It has to be done at the local level. And that's where you, know, you come in for sure. Um, and th those are some of the challenges, challenges I'll face, you know, I face every year with the little bills that come forward that seek to do good things. But uh, again, take us in incrementally closer to micromanaging from the Sacramento level again. You know, keeping with you, Assemblymember O'Donnell, um, the last few years, the legislature has made big strides in terms of addressing the systemic teacher shortage throughout the state. And we have a question from the audience that says, given the, the shortages in K-12 education, what do you see as the prospects for recruiting and preparing teachers and new administrators and staff to lead this new state system um, for pre-K to 12? So we've started to address the systemic need to bring more teachers in and keep more teachers in the classroom. But there's a, a communications challenge as well, right? How do we bring more people into a system um, that they want to stay in? Well, there, there's volume and there's velocity. So uh, certainly we need more teachers. Uh, and we're starting to see some improvement on that front. I think the velocity, we, we responded a bit in the state legislature the last couple of years by incentivizing uh, some of our higher eds to get some of the credential programs uh, more streamlined. I had a bill a couple years ago that the governor did in fact sign, which allows for a teacher to get a degree in education. So we can incorporate some of that training into that four year experience, which, which I think is, is very positive. Uh, but also it's, it's also quality. And where does the quality front come? I think that, that internships, getting teachers in the classroom, potential teachers in the classroom as early as possible. Because I can tell you, even as a teacher myself, you know, I, I should have spent more time learning my craft before I walked in that room and had command of my own classroom. Thank you. Um, let's see. One other question from the audience. What research, and this might be for Heather or Rucker, um, is needed to inform policy to scale and sustain um, California's rating and improvement system? Quality counts in California. You want me to jump in? Go for it. So I think one of the things that we, I think, are moving with greater understanding is holistic measures of outcomes, including socio-emotional development, behavioral outcomes, and not just this kind of narrow and myopic focus on short-run test scores. And w when studies have done this with kind of integrated systems that look at health and social emotional well-being as well as test scores in high school graduation rates and grade point average they found that students behavior is a much stronger predictor of future success than test scores are and moreover that teachers who help students improve their behavior were 10 times as effective at improving their students graduation rates and grade point averages as those teachers who focused on test scores alone so i think that that kind of informs the kind of systems of measurement and evaluation that have to be holistic and looking at what's working and how we define success. Yeah, I completely agree. And with, with regards to early childhood, uh, where the QRIS is situated, I think we have to be cognizant in the development of the system and the development of the data system. There's lots of simultaneous things that are happening here. We have to be cognizant about what our goals are across these multiple dimensions so that as we're building the system and the data to measure it, we're actually capturing all of the information that helps us know if we're meeting the goal that we're intending to with the system. Okay, we're getting the sign for just a couple minutes left. So for all of you, as you look ahead at the next two to four years, what policy moves that maybe we haven't talked about yet or that you want to reinforce will be key to continue, continuing California's progress towards equity and excellence? Uh, 
Uh, so a quick list for me would be uh, focusing in on, and it's been lifted up, uh, I believe in the report, uh, building capacity of systems to engage community uh, in a real way to kind of meet them more than halfway, uh, which is really the responsibility of systems. Um, also uh, focusing on early care and education um, and making sure that equity is built tightly into that rollout as it needs to be with everything else that we're doing. And so to, to again, think about the ecological view of, of equity. And the last thing I would mention is um, focusing in on more supports uh, for dual language learners um, as a, such a huge population uh, of our student base uh, in California. I, I think one thing that I would add is we have a huge communications challenge in this state. And we've talked about this in a number of different ways, but we collectively are about, we, over the next few years, I expect that we'll go to voters and ask them for more money. We have some plans on the table, others that I think we'll see emerge. But we don't have as broad support across our state for some of the investments that we need to be making. Pace had a poll last month that showed not super strong support for early childhood investment. And I think that that's to a large degree because the public maybe doesn't understand how critically important that investment is and why that's great for our state. And so we need to make that case. And we also need to make the case not only that we need more money, but also that we're going to make good use of money if we put it into the system because there is not universal trust in all of the local schools and systems that more money would actually result in the kind of changes that we believe and hope that it can with the right capacity that's built into that investment. Um, so as we go forward with this, we, we all have a case to make. And I, I would just echo that, as Heather was just saying, that until recently, California, even though we're a relatively high tax state ranking among the eight to 12 you know, highest tax states, children receive among the bottom quartile of state tax dollars as a proportion relative to other states. So that's just important to keep in mind. I guess I would close with just recentering our attention to the importance of teacher quality and our valuation of teachers and the way we support them. Because it's still the case that our least experienced teachers, our least experienced principals, are disproportionately allocated to the lowest performing schools. And that kind of suboptimal allocation of quality is a clear uh, risk factor for us fulfilling the promise of equal opportunity. Excellent. It's, it's multiple things. I, I, I think in particular, you know, we've talked about you, know, I, you, you had mentioned in Oakland right now, right? So we see what's happening with the labor issues that are happening in, in our state right now. And when, what we know is, is that if you have labor issues, if you have governance issues, you're not getting that instruction, right? So something has to be done about that. And we have to address what those issues are, right? And we can't ignore those anymore. So I think we have to really be thinking about this. I also, I get quite a bit of folks in the field who are, who are struggling a little bit that, you know, we have this loose, tight system, right? I think we've all talked about the old system was very tight, right? It was, we come in, we told people what to do. We didn't really believe in local control. There's some folks that think that's a little bit too loose on where we've come, right? And where we struggle, and I will tell you where I lose sleep at night, in particular with those districts that are really, really struggling is, is, is thinking, do we, are we doing this quick enough? There are kids that are suffering in those districts and there's, should we be doing more? What can, more can we do? And then recognizing there isn't more that we can do that's gonna make a change tomorrow. It takes time. So I think continuing to invest in the system is important, but then also looking at there are some folks where there's some things within the system, I think we need to tighten up a little bit so we can make sure that, that we are where those kids are really suffering, that we're providing some more resources and some more opportunities to help them. Not going back to the old system of going and telling folks what to do, right? But really being actually going in and assisting them and helping them with some of the resources. What you heard, I thought it was interesting in the earlier panel, you heard the superintendent talking about these great practices around where he brought in art and music teachers and he, he knew the importance of collaboration, right? So, but he also understood the importance of the arts, right? So he did some great things to do that, to free up the time so teachers could come together. And then he was pretty systemic about how he approached it. And the other teachers said, I need more time. I would love to meet more with my colleagues. 
one district doing this, another district not doing something that we know is a good practice. We've got to figure out ways, and I really feel like that's part of the role that we can play is how do we make sure that folks are aware of those, those practices and to make sure that what they're doing actually is the right thing. We, you've heard of the resources in the financial piece too. And I'm a strong believer that we need more resources, but I've never believed that money was the only answer, right? Because what I see in some of our districts is they're spending money, but sometimes they're spending money not in the right ways, right? Or not in the right things. Yeah, Any from, from the legislative perspective, uh, my priorities will be uh, treating Proposition 98 as the floor, not the ceiling, so that we can adequately fund, yes. Um, and you play a role in that too, so educate your, 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 your legislators, uh, because it, 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 it's basically treated, hey, there's Prop 98, there's your, there's your bucket of money education. When we can go beyond uh, what we're legally obligated to, to, give, uh, to give to schools. Um, it'll also be uh, the teacher pipeline, making sure that we also have quality teachers. Uh, CTE, career tech ed, is a big deal to me as a high school teacher. I saw many a student fall off the path of high school success because they weren't engaged, because there just wasn't anything there for them. And CTE will engage many of those kids. And also when we talk about systems, one of the tools we use to assess schools, not the only tool, is the SBAC test. I think we need to reboot that test, take a look at it so that it's more teacher friendly. Remember, I bring the teacher perspective. Good, <laughs> I like that. Uh, and what do I mean by that? It, it, it is summative in nature now, the okay, end of your test. It should be a more formative tool. And if you look at the original code section, when it originally contemplated and passed, it spoke to a formative tool. So one of the pushes I'll be making this year is to develop that formative tool because it's a very practical tool a teacher can use in the classroom on a daily basis. Uh, what do I mean by that? A teacher can go in and you know, type in some standards and get some, some, some examples of what, what, what they might have on the SBAC test so that teachers can kind of, you know, not teach the test necessarily, but understand where this might come up uh, in, in, in the testing scheme and, and better prepare students uh, through a better tool for teachers in the classroom. So that. Okay. Well, we're going to give you the last say there. Um, and I just want to underscore what we've heard from these panelists in the prior panel, that there's a practice challenge, there's a policy challenge, but we also heard there's a communications challenge that we all play a role in, right? In, in sharing best practices and elevating those that I think it's important to remember as well. So if you join me in thanking the panel. Thank you all. And we're gonna take a few minutes to shift the conversation to your tables. We've had a lot of diverse perspectives here across our panels. There's a lot of diversity in the audience as well. So we wanna harness some of that. So if you haven't yet, talk to your neighbor and introduce yourself. And then use the next 10 minutes as we're getting lunches served to the tables um, to, to share your own perspective. Where have you seen emerging strengths in education over the past eight years? And where do you still see challenges and what policy moves should happen next? Thank you so much. So we're gonna, ready to wrap up the day. Linda Darling Hammond's gonna come up. We've talked a lot about uh, how far we've come, some of the challenges that we're still facing. And Linda's gonna talk to us a little bit about sort of next steps and where we're going. Linda Darling Hammond, thank you. Well, I really appreciate everyone sort of hanging in there with this very intense amount of thinking and information and reflection on where we've been and where we're going. Uh, it's such a key moment. Um, I want to, uh, both for continuity and for change, and I study states and uh, nations that have undergone educational reforms. There are some places that have really climb to the top of the equity and excellence rankings in both our country and elsewhere. And one of the key things is that they've had a continuous process over 20 years, sometimes 30 years or 40 years, of continually improving, of building on what they know, rather than having the pendulum swings that we have so often experienced in our country and in our state. So I think this is a key moment for both continuity and change. 
I want to recognize how massive the changes have been. Uh, what Jerry Brown and Mike Kirst uh, and others accomplished, I saw Rick Simpson here, he was part of dreaming up this um, set of um, reforms that we have. Um, obviously, Tom Trollickson and Glenn Price in the department and all of the folks from CDE who worked on it and in the state board. Karen Staff Walters is here. She was rowing in that boat. Uh, Mary Sandy at the CTC, Jenny Johnson. I mean, there's so many folks who are here. I could probably name almost everyone here um, who has contributed to getting us uh, where we are today. Uh, and I also want to recognize the genius of the reforms that are underway. So I want to put a little perspective on it. Uh, you know, uh, John Marrow did that film, uh, From First to Worst, which described California's descent from sort of the 1970s when we were thought to be one of the highest performing states uh, in the nation. And the U.S. was one of the highest performing states educationally in the world, uh, probably the highest. Prop 13, which we've heard a lot about, uh, the, you know, the steady decline in funding, uh, the, uh, you know, uh, pro the uh, issues in the Williams lawsuit, I know John Affeld is here and others from public advocates who were part of that litigation. Uh, when it got to the point where we had 50,000 teachers on emergency permits, where we had huge inequality uh, among districts, there was a three to one ratio of spending between rich and poor districts uh, that was, you know, part of the um, sort of a spillover effects of the proposition. Uh, we were low spending, we were unequal in our spending, the places that had the greatest needs, uh, including many of our cities, Los Angeles and um, places like Compton and Oakland, were spending below the state average, even though they had students with greater needs, there were districts going bankrupt, there were massive layoffs, there were cuts. Uh, it was pretty bad. Uh, and when you look at how low we had gone, and in fact, on every achievement marker, you know, we were 48th, 47th, 49th, thank God for Mississippi, is what people would say when the results came up, but then Mississippi surpassed us on some of those measures. So now, you know, here's where we are um, since 2011. The local control funding formula is actually one of the most progressive funding systems in the country. There's a document that's put out every year called Is School Funding Fair? And the states are ranked about their amount of spending and the fairness of their fund funding. We used to be at the very bottom, both in the amount of money and the regressiveness of the spending. We're now in the top 10 states in terms of the progressiveness of the spending. Um, clearly, there's not enough money in the system. Everybody's made that clear. Uh, but um, as Mike Kirst put it, you know, we went from somewhere around 48th in uh, state spending to about 25th. But our cost of living is so high that if you take that into account, we're still back down at around 41st or whatever the number is. But we have made huge, huge strides. And although Williams was settled, this governor did that without a lawsuit um, requiring it. Uh, and that's an extraordinary thing. If you look across the country, I mean, every state has been battling the inequalities in funding that are built into the American local property uh, tax system for many, many, many decades. There are more than 40 states with that kind of litigation. Every state has its state flag, its state bird, and its state school finance lawsuit. And we had uh, you know, a leadership team that had the determination and the courage and the vision to, to really turn that around and give us a base on which to build. That is uh, very, very, very rare. Uh, another piece of this that is so important are the eight state priorities. Um, we went from, uh, we before the feds changed uh, under ESSA to allowing multiple measures, which they did in part because California had already done uh, the eight state priorities. Um, we, uh, in, as part of the LCFF process, identified the fact that kids um, deserve basic services. They deserve certain kinds of resources. They deserve um, opportunities to learn that. We would measure curriculum access. We would measure school climate. We would measure suspension rates. We'd look at um, pupil outcomes in a broad course of study, pupil engagement, graduation rates, et cetera. Uh, we began to build a framework for a whole child vision of what schools should be doing and accomplishing. 
And in the college and career ready uh, indicator that's still somewhat under construction, uh, we'll be looking at what kids get access to uh, in terms of the kind of coursework and the kinds of opportunities to learn uh, and to engage in career-ready education, but also civic engagement. So we've begun to actually say that school is about more than just producing a test score on a multiple choice test in which there's one answer out of five that you're looking for. Uh, that actually had, had a ripple effect across the country. I know because I was one of the people talking to other states and talking to people in Washington about the fact that multiple measures could propel schools to look at more of the right things and that had a contribution to us having a new federal law. There was a huge change in the way we define accountability. Accountability for a long period of time was uh, setting targets and goals for student test scores and then punishing schools, teachers, and kids who didn't meet the targets. It had nothing to do with investing. It didn't have a sense of what's the state accountable for to teachers and to parents and to kids. Uh, and it was in many cases, and certainly in California, a situation of testing without investing. Uh, where we were measuring uh, but, uh, and uh, trying to, quote, drive um, scores uh, with various kinds of interventions and sanctions, but not really investing in a continuous improvement process, a capacity building process, not paying attention to what kids are getting as well as what uh, they were able to do as a result. So we've redefined accountability. And I think the kind of accountability that we are now working with is one in which uh, if you can imagine a triangle, uh, we're focusing much more on meaningful learning. What do kids really need to know to do well in the 21st century in their lives as well as in school? Uh, how do we build professional capacity to allow schools to provide that kind of education? And then where's the resource accountability for in making the investments in wise and thoughtful ways for that to happen? Uh, and that's another part of the brilliance of the California approach. The LCAP, you know, for many of you, if you're in districts uh, or county offices or so on, you know, the LCAP is a bit of a pain in the neck. You gotta fill out these forms and they're long and there's a lot of pages and there's a lot of questions and a lot of indicators. But what it's doing also, along with all of that, is asking us to look at these eight state priorities, uh, really figure out how are we gonna invest in ways that allow kids to progress uh, along those dimensions, uh, along all of those multiple measures, engaging the community in new ways, educators, parents, community groups, doing that regularly and asking that the budget will follow our goals. Uh, budgets used to be completely dissociated from educational goals. And uh, many of you may not know that Mike started out as a budget guy. And this is, you know, in part his, uh, you know, deep insight that you want uh, investments of money to be driven by a conversation about what are we trying to accomplish here. We're the only state in the country that has this kind of continuous improvement system in this way in place and many other states are asking how do we get a continuous pr improvement process going. Uh, this, if we can continue to perfect it, if we can continue to refine it, if we can continue, you know, the efforts that are needed to make it uh, become its best self uh, is a really um, innovative and uh, important way to get our communities working on how we improve, uh, how we invest in our children to allow that improvement to occur. Uh, yes, let's... Let's give all of ourselves a hand for having gotten this far. <laughs> uh, because it's been a lot of work. It's been a lot of work, as, um, as we've said, you know, from all of the parts of the system. The other genius of the last few years is that, you know, we've managed to get lots of folks working together. Uh, it used to be that the state superintendent and the state board might fight, and there'd be a separate secretary of education, and there would be CTC was sitting over there doing its own thing, and community groups were fighting with educators, and, you know, it was kind of a hot mess. And uh, we've, we've begun to develop social-emotional competencies uh, between and among the agencies and the uh, interest groups and so on in our state 
to work collaboratively uh, in a deliberate way uh, towards these goals. And I think that's something we need uh, and, and must continue. Um, I also want to say a word about the nature of learning. Uh, because we've talked a lot about systems and money and all those things, but it's really about what, what do kids get to learn. Uh, the new standards that we have in place, uh, which were put in place in, in California in a really thoughtful way with time for educators to uh, get used to and engage with the standards and engage in professional learning and with assessments that are better measures of those standards and are not only finding one right answer out of five, but include performance tasks for kids to worry on, work on. Uh, the standards really do support inquiry. We are, as human beings, we are inquiring beings. That's how we got everything that we have in our society came from human inquiry. Somebody saying, well, what would happen if I, you know, did this? Or, gee, we dropped the meat in the fire, now it tastes better, you know, let's do that again sometime, and you know. Then we got to Julia Child, you know. I mean, so it's, all, it's always a, a process of, we got to fried chicken. That was my personal uh, celebration. Um, but the, the inquiring uh, human being uh, is what school has to be about. And it's what the new standards are pointing us towards. Uh, it's not just about memorizing the things you could be Googling, uh, but it is also about learning to think and inquire and problem solve. Uh, and so we've, we've adopted those standards. We are shifting the nature of learning in schools so that it's more appropriate for what kids are going to have to do in this knowledge-based economy and society. Uh, we're changing the way in which supports for improvement happen. We know a lot about so the sciences of learning and development, and much more of what we're doing today is in line with how people actually learn than what we were doing a decade ago. Um, Assemblyman. O'Donnell talked about the scripted curriculum that we experienced. Well, what was that doing? It was basically saying uh, everybody learns in the same way at the same pace. We know that to be false. Uh, it was saying that uh, you could just learn by uh, teachers talking and kids listening. We know that to be false from the science of learning. We know that interaction and communication is part of learning. Uh, we know that uh, kids learn in different ways and teachers have to be allowed to be responsive to that learning process. We know that kids achieve at higher levels when they're uh, learning social and emotional skills alongside and integrated with academic skills. We know that kids learn better uh, when they have access also to physical activity uh, rather than just sitting for hours on end, you know, uh, doing test prep. Um, that, in fact, we, our brains develop more effectively when that's the case. We know that people learn more effectively uh, and become smarter and more intelligent in the neural uh, pathways that they develop when they're engaged in art and music and learning multiple languages. We are going to become a smarter state as we take up the goals for multilingualism that are now part of California's look towards the future. Uh, and all of these things that are beginning to be part of the educational landscape um, are uh, going to allow us to teach kids in ways that allow schools to be more engaging, more joyful, uh, and more productive for their learning as human beings. So as Rucker Johnson put it, it's the synergy among these things that matters. It's, you know, what we teach and how we teach matters. Uh, spending money on the right kind of learning and supports matters, and that's been said any number of times. Uh, as I've mentioned already, continuity matters. Continuity matters for nations and for states that are doing large-scale reform, but it also matters in districts and in schools. We are going to be bringing out from Learning Policy Institute a study very shortly on positive outliers, districts that are closing the achievement gap and moving all kids forward uh, at higher rates than would normally be expected. Chula Vista is one of those districts, you saw them. Uh, and one of the things we find there is that continuity of staffing, continuity of leadership, continuity of teachers, uh, and support for continual learning and improvement uh, is what drives those efforts. So what should we focus on? I think there are three things that are really going to be important as we move forward. Obviously, there's uh, change as well to um, refine and build on where we are and to address the things that have not yet been addressed. Uh, I do think that we do need to build uh, 
as much of our curriculum energy as possible uh, around how people learn. So we need to go deeper uh, into the ways in which uh, children learn, uh, socially, emotionally, academically, uh, to continue to build the uh, curriculum so it is broad, rich, deep, engaging, to value the uh, experiential kind of learning, the uh, human inquiry that drives us all in our uh, interests and in our, um, in our activity. Uh, and then to do, uh, secondly, the kind of capacity building that's been talked about today. Uh, the kind of support for educators and for others who work with children in the youth development sector and in health and human services uh, so that they're well prepared, well inducted, uh, have many opportunities for ongoing learning. I want us to focus on a day where every educator and everyone who works with children in California who wants to improve practice and wants to support kids should have ready access without cost to them and without looking around under rocks to try to find professional development to the kind of learning and skills that they need to succeed. I mean, that should be a fundamental uh, of, the, uh, of the system that uh, we ensure that the, the sacred work of education, of teaching and leading schools is supported by opportunities to learn uh, in ways that allow us to meet the needs of kids. That's what educators wanna do. That's gonna mean systems have to also be uh, addressed like special education systems and other systems that we know need to be addressed. And finally, in the area of resource accountability, obviously we need more resources and there'll be a lot of revenue sources that are examined and looked at uh, for uh, building those revenue sources. Uh, Rucker also mentioned that while we um, have a fairly rich tax base, we're spending much less of it on children uh, than uh, many other states. Well, what are we spending it on? Some of what we're spending it on is what began in the 1980s when uh, Ronald Reagan was the governor and we began to incarcerate rather than educate. And over that period of time, expenditures for prisons went from about 2% of the state budget to well over 12% of the state budget. So part of what we need to be thinking about in our future is how are we going to educate rather than incarcerate? How are we going to, rather than spending $60,000 on a young person uh, who failed to graduate from high school and couldn't make a living, and ended up in uh, prison, how are we gonna spend the $15,000 on them that would allow them to get a good education uh, and stop being penny wise and pound foolish? And finally, we need to um, evaluate to better educate. We need to be looking at all of this work that's going on uh, as the getting down to facts studies have done and as so many other uh, researchers have been engaged with and continue to figure out what's working how do we build on it, what's not working, how do we refine it, tweak it, change it, and move it forward. Um, that's actually the primary way uh, that and investments in educators that Finland has done its work over these years that it went from being sort of the bottom of uh, the barrel in Scandinavia to the top of the uh, PISA rankings. So I just wanna close and leave us um, moving forward with, um, the, the thoughts of um, John Dewey, who, as I often say, plagiarized everything I thought before I thought it. <laughs> but it's especially poignant for our state right now, and I'm reminded of what John Kim was talking about, uh, the effect on children of, of the way in which our state began to disinvest as it became more diverse. And think of this in that context as we think about our future. What the best and wisest parent, I wanna add grandparent now that I am one, wants for his or her child, that must the community want for all of its children. Any other goal is narrow and unlovely. Acted upon, it destroys our democracy. Only by being true to the full growth of all the individuals who make it up can society by any chance be true to itself. Let us be true to the California that we are building today. And thank you for all of the work that you have done 
to make this moment possible and the moments to come. Thank you. Thank you, Linda, for those concluding and inspiring remarks. Um, we're going to wrap up very soon. I just wanted to encourage you all to fill out the evaluations on your table so we can engage in continuous improvement ourselves. <laughs> A reminder, there's material outside on the tables. There's this really terrific report that, that Roberta and uh, her colleagues put together. Uh, also encourage those of you who have not signed up for Ed Source's daily email and our weekly podcast. This is going to be featured in our podcast on Saturday this week in California education. And also, uh, Linda mentioned getting down to facts, uh, which is just an incredible resource and does lay out kind of a roadmap for the way forward. That's on the PACE website. Um, and. Also, just to really express appreciation for this terrific partnership between uh, Learning Policy Institute and EdSource. Collaboration is the key, whether it's in the classroom or in the nonprofit world. Um, and, you know, just a thought that I, I leave today really feeling convinced that we have a ter tremendous platform on which to build. I think the key is going to be how do we continue to build on it and make sure that these reforms work because they have to work. We can't go back to the voters and, you know, every 10 years of this didn't work, we're going to try something else. But we have a platform to build on. The governor has put another layer on the table, cradle to career. So that will strengthen this. It seems like that, that we, is an opportunity to build further synergy, to build early education and post-secondary and the workplace into this seamless pathway, which I know we all believe in. But the key will be to integrate that without abandoning a continuous focus on making these reforms work. Uh, as as uh, Linda pointed out, it's 15 to 20 years trajectory and we are not anywhere near that. So, uh, and I just on a personal note, um, I grew up in uh, South Africa, in Cape Town. When I was a teenager, Nelson Mandela was incarcerated in Robben Island. You could see the island out there. Never thought I would see him, but I was privileged many years later as a journalist to see Nelson Mandela actually cast his vote and to report on the, the end of apartheid in uh, South Africa. So if Nelson Mandela could end apartheid in South Africa, I think we can achieve equity here in California. It may take some time, but it can be done. And I know with all the energy in this room, um, I'm feeling more encouraged than ever. So thank you for being here today and look forward to further work with all of you. Thank you.